Hello, Simon here. Now, before uh, we get going with today's large format photography podcast, um, I just thought it's good to let you know that something happened in the show and that uh, it was a case of uh, Shane was was talking and we were pretty much lost for words um, as to what to say next. And normally uh, we would uh, put a pause in there, um, have a little chat and then carry on recording and edit it and nobody would know any better but this time uh, we left it in uh, because it moved into a natural conversation and I think it's best that that conversation was left in the show Um, the reason why I'm saying all this is because um, certainly in the case of me I was a little freer than I normally am with my opinions um, because generally speaking I try to keep things uh, pretty neutral um, but I didn't today Um, and so I just giving you a little bit of a warning on that one really so i hope you enjoy today's show hello and welcome to episode 36 of the large format photography podcast my name is simon forster and i'm joined by andrew bartram and shane bulkovich oh no no that that wasn't good enough It was close. It was close. I, I, I concentrate on the bulco bit. It doesn't matter. Just go with it. Just be. Just go yeah, with it. Edit it. Just go with it now. It doesn't in, matter. That's in a the, fun in, introduction. In in that case, that was that was hello hello everybody. Um, so hello Andrew. Hi Simon. And hello Shane. Nice to talk to you, gentlemen. It's great to have you here uh, with us, Shane. Um, right, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Jenny Sampson uh, for being our guest uh, two weeks ago. Um, really interesting show, and uh, one of the comments that uh, was was made about the show was it was really uplifting. Uh, and I totally agree with that. It was uh, it was a it was great chatting to you, Jenny. Um, right, so as usual, uh, let's head over to the Fens and see what Andrew's been up to. Well. Not a lot, really, to be honest. Um, so I've, I've got no rants this week. You'll be pleased to know I felt awfully guilty after ranting last time. So um, we won't repeat that. Um, just getting ready to go away in the caravan to the Lake District, hoping we don't get locked down again. Um, I am taking a large format camera with me, but it's large format pinhole camera. So um, other than that, um, yeah, just, you know, not not done much, not Pulled a large format camera out. Uh, been in the dark room a bit. Been plotting for my semi-retirement next year. And uh, I've, I've seen yeah. some. I've seen some posts about with lith printing that you've been up to and stuff like that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's um. This is the year of the lith. The, <laughs> is there a film there somewhere? Uh, the lith lord there's, or something? There's an impediment, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So I'm. Uh, it's a. Yeah, probably not a conversation for now, but I'm uh, I'm making a series of little lift prints and making them available. I'm just testing the water, really, making them available via my sort of Twitter community. And um, there's an interesting debate about whether I should be pricing these things as low as I am, and I think I'm doing the right thing. Other people have said I'm underselling it, mm. um, but I, I'd quite like to get... They're, they're small prints, they're only sort of four by five, but they're going to be matted and uh, put in a nice little bag and sent out. And I'd rather get more of these things out at a, at a low price so people can have them than try and sell these things for, you know, a load of money, really. Uh, whether whether that's not – but then I don't need to sell them for a load of money, really. I, I'm looking to cover some costs. I'm not really looking to cover my own time. It's not my business, you know. So I don't know, but it's an interesting experience. I've never really sold many prints before, but um, yeah, I've, a couple of days I've got um, pre-orders for about fourteen so far. I think it's kind of like so, um, it's kind of like putting children out in the world, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm I now feel scared. Like I'm I... actually scared now. It's all very well saying to people, um, "Would you like?" You know, because I just did an iPhone picture of it and said, "Well, this is you know going to make these available," and I'm making them available for. Eight eight pounds, including um, postage. You see, and for, I have actually sold a few for in the United States and charged a bit more for postage, but not not, not a great deal really. Um, but uh, I'm now scared of, about having to now make the prints and release them. 
Yeah, there's there's value to be said in having people enjoy your work, though. So I, I feel kind of the same way as I'd rather have a lot of them out there and at a lower price than than limit and people that want something that aren't able to enjoy it. I mean, that's that's why we do this, right? I mean, it is. Well, um, what else do you do with? I mean, before social media, you know, I I just used to go to our local camera club and meet up with a few. You know, I was like twenty five or something, and most of them would have been about my age now, so old codgers, I would have looked at them and said, well, yes, you know. And, and I wouldn't have, I, I would have struggled to find a community of like-minded um, analog photography, you know, evangelists like I, like I was mm-hmm. then and am now. Um, but social media has just opened that world up, really, hasn't it? And, and, I, and I love sending out postcards. You know, I print lots of those Ilford postcards and I just – say to people on Twitter, anyone would like a print because I just like to send these things through the post, you know? Yeah, it's what it's what's worked about. I mean, it doesn't do any good in a, in a shelf or in a box or, no. you know, not, not seen. So I, I, I get a lot of value. So, you know, that when you talk about money and stuff, there's there, there has to be some kind of value has to be put on the fact that you're able to get works of art into other people's hands around the world. Um, there, there's, there's, that has to account for something. It's it's always going to be a, a, a difficult uh, thing when you when you're mixing business and art uh, together, um, and especially when you when you're you're, you're setting out, uh, because you know we we can look at some of the the people that are out there producing great art and and um, realizing you know really high prices and all all this kind of stuff, and then we look at the look at what we do. Uh, I'm, I'm about to say when I say we, I'm perhaps talking about myself and Andrew here, um, and it, it becomes quite difficult for us to put a uh, a value on 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 what we what we do, um, and it's it, it's it's finding where your worth is, is 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 incredibly difficult because generally speaking, and then this goes for most photographers, we we all have a relatively low opinion of what mm. we do and compared to everybody else. So I'm just just wondering, Shane, how you how how you would tackle that that kind of situation. Well, I just um, I just look at uh, you know I've never I'm not a good judge of my work, so I, I let other people make the determinations whether or not something's good or not. Um, as far as um, value and stuff like that, I've I've had uh, I sold an eight by ten black glass amber type and original just a couple of weeks ago for three thousand um, dollars. Which, was, if you would have told me eight years ago that at one point you'd you'd sell an, an original um, glass plate for that amount of money, I would have said you're a liar. So um, it, it's a lot of it's in the uh, the eye of the beholder what people are willing to pay. Um, I, I just don't happen to be a really good judge on. Um, on a lot of that stuff. So I just, I, I put it out there and if it's priced too high, then I, I just lower it. And, you know, I, I sell a lot of my prints for just like $50 or whatever. And, and but what, what's important for me is when I do put anything out in the world, I'm always, I'm always signing it. And I'm always, I'm usually, I try to, you know, limit the edition. So I've always number them. So well, that, 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 if it's important for me, that's interesting. Cause I, I've said th- this little, it's the theme in this little set of prints I'm doing is called memory relics and memories. And I, I, I discovered one day that I had these little images on my shot on my Rolleiflex, and I was clearly photographing the same sort of thing. It was, and it could be like a, a photograph torn, a torn photograph on a on a greenhouse was one, and and it could be some garden shears that someone had discarded, something that could hold some meaning, um, maybe not for me, but for somebody. And mm-hmm. So this series started coming together in my head, and then I've got back into lith printing after many many years and and it's a process i love and uh, and i shared a few of these pictures and got some favorable comments and um and i've completely forgotten that why, why did i start down this train of thought simon help me here what was uh, i because you're selling your your prints too cheaply yeah I don't think that was it though. I, I don't, I don't I, know. What I, was, I don't know. I was on a train of thought, and it's gone, gone completely. Out of I my can head. tell you one of my pet peeves is that you know we were talking about numbering them or assigning oh, the them. Numbering that was like it. That. Sorry. Yeah. yeah there you go. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. There, otherwise, I'll forget again. Yeah. Numbering. So yeah, you said about numbering. So I've said, um, you know, I just said, oh, I've got these prints. They're going to be a limited print run. And then yesterday, I said I'm going to limit it to twenty. Um, is that is that a good thing to do? Should should I should I number them? Should I 
should I should I sign them? And if so, where should I sign them, Shane? Should I sign should I sh- sign the print? Should I sign the mount? Should I sign the back? I mean, I'm getting stressed on all sorts of levels now. Well, you just have to be consistent, and that's one of my big pet peeves. Is that um, you know you'll find an, an old art print or something like that, and, and you buy it or something, and you look at it, and you don't know who's in the image if there's a person, mm. or you don't know who took it, or you don't even know what continent it was taken on, and yeah. it drives me absolute bonkers. Um, I've got old wet plates in here in my studio that are 160 years old. They've been matted and cared for, and I, you, you op- I open every one of them up delicately and dust them off, and I look for some kind of signature. Who is the person in the picture? Yeah. Who is the person that made it? Where was this made? What date was it made? And the fact is, it's not there. So my big pet peeve, and if I could give any advice, is that, and I get, um, I've got a permanent exhibition here in my studio. The entire changing room, um, dressing room, is an exhibition of works from around the world that I get sent from um, my fellow uh, photography friends and painters and whoever, whatever piece of art you want to send me, I hang it up and display. There's a little plaque that says this is a permanent exhibition. But um, I find myself, I'll get a print in the mail from someone. I just love it. And it's not signed. And it's not, I don't, so I find myself turning these prints over and writing the artist's name on the back for them and putting the date that I know. And, you know, if they said it had a title, I put the title on the back. I'm just meticulous about my, my, um, my documenting because that's where the value is, right? I mean, you can enjoy something a hundred years from now. And, and as a person who makes plates that are going to be around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, I understand a lot of people don't think in these perspectives, but my, my work will be here properly cared for a long, long time from now. Um, I know what I value and what I want and what I desire is when you look at a portrait and I'm, a, I'm a, mostly a portrait guy. Um, I, I desire to know who is in the picture. I desire to know who took the picture. I desire to know where was the picture taken. And I desire the date. These are things that are just, you know, the picture for me means so much more. The work of art means so much more. And this could go for sculptures, anything. I mean, if they're not labeled and stuff, they're just, they just seem discarded. And it, um, you know, it's just my take on it. I, I, it's not that I'm right. I just feel that. Um, and when the students come in, um, I am always telling them, if you make it and my kids, when I, my daughters, my, my eight year old daughter, my nine year old daughter, and, um, when they make art, I said, did you sign the back? Did mm-hmm. you put the date? And, and they're always, uh, it's kind of like a family joke. You got to sign it. You got to date it. So that's kind of my take is, um, it, oh. it just, it has more value. You, you, you almost, uh, you're taking care. You're caring for it. By, by doing that and you're caring like- you're caring for the future as well i i my mum my late mum had boxes and boxes of family photographs now i'll say to anyone who cares to listen print your work or make a book of it you know doc, uh, put make it into a tangible form somehow because all those thousands of pictures you've got up on the cloud aren't going to be there in 100 years. I'll guarantee it. They're probably not going to be there in 10 years, quite frankly. And I they'll, be, they'll be gone. So, but my mum was terrible. She'd have all, and she'd just put, all she'd write on the back is something like, mum. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether she meant herself or her mother. I, I don't know who these people are. Or or she'll say, Archie, you know. Well, great, you know. She knew who who it was, but, you know, come on, mum. We tried to tell her when she was with us, but she wouldn't do it, you know. So I'm absolutely with you from the humblest snapshot of your family, right on the back of it and put it in your shoebox and give it to your kids. Bring it into the real world. I mean, I, I bring it into the real world. Um, and, and you'd you'd have to argue that, you know, um, if if these uh, a lot of these you know these pictures in the past were documented well documented that they'd probably be saved but when someone inherits a shoebox of photographs and they don't know anything about any of the people in them you know there there's you're you're not throwing Uncle Danny away you know because you don't know that's Uncle Danny do you know what I'm saying yeah. you just they just get discarded because they they don't really the the person who took the image didn't take the time. Um, or value the work enough or just was naive or didn't have an understanding that this would exist after they're gone. And um, if you don't do that, if you don't care for your images, like you said, the cloud, I mean, I get, I hear it all the time. Oh, all my images are on the cloud and I'm fine. Um, I had 4,500 images on um, Apple's cloud, which is probably one of the most successful and largest iClouds in the world. Um, and uh, 4,500 of my images just went poof one day. And I got on the phone with Apple and they said, well, we, we don't, 
not much, nothing we can do about it. So people trust in the, you know, that's everyone's solution to, uh, oh, print your stuff. They say, oh, I got it on the cloud and I don't have to worry about it. The cloud is nothing more than someone else's server that you don't know in another, maybe even another country. So uh, how, how can you trust that? And, and when I lost 4,500 of my, just my iPhone photographs, it's my only other camera I own. Um, it was devastating to me and um, there was nothing. So that technology will let you down. You um, are, are, as I've been reading your book and listening to your uh, documentary, which we'll touch on, I, I, jot, I tend to just jot things down. I think it'll be useful to, and I jotted down a phrase. I, I jotted down several phrases, but I, I did one that struck me was making history today. Do you remember saying that? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we we think of history as everything in the past, right? And mm-hmm. and um and I think until I took that photograph of Ernie Lapointe, the great grandson of Sitting Bull, um, I had that same kind of perspective. And then it it dawned on me is that, well, who are we today? I mean, 150 years from now, um, is my work and other photographers' work from this era is it not going to be valued? Is people not going to want to see what we're like? So we are history today. Yeah. And, but everyone's so, we're all just always looking to the past. And, but when you actually have, like, I, I actually captured the great grandson of Sitting Bull here in Bismarck. I mean, that, that is the, that is the, the plate that knocked on the door at the Historical <laughs> Society of North Dakota. All my other work is following it. But that was the plate that got me in the door. Um, so it, it just proves to me that we are making history today and we, we need to value that history and we need to document that history. And and I, I think it was the um, one of the founders of Google, if I'm not mistaken, but he, he said that, um, you know, this is going to be a lost generation, that we won't, uh, you know, we are trusting um, our our uh, memories and our images and so forth, our portraits to technology that we don't quite understand um, how it's going to get into the future. And, and so I, I'm, I'm with you 100% on that, that um, trusting a bunch of zeros and ones in a long data file, um, it, it's not too smart. Hmm. I've got to say, I, I, all of the bad things about these traits and things, it's pretty much describing me. <laughs> except, <laughs> except I, don't, I don't even put that much in the cloud. You know, it, it, I've just got stuff on my computer and then and even my negatives and things like that there there's there's no filing system going on there i, I couldn't lay in fact uh, i'd go to a, a weekly darkroom club um and i couldn't actually remember where any of my negatives were that for or even what i actually wanted to take with me to be printed um i'm just so disorganized but that that thing it's it's ringing really true to me what you were saying about you know, the lack of information uh, with 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 photographs. I mean, I I bought uh, a job lot of stuff at a at an auction uh, a year ago, and and with that uh, job lot came um, a load of uh, unused dry plates, um, and uh, you know you know very old ones, um, and and also some exposed ones, and. The exp- you know, some some of them are you know there's 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 a there's a there's a range in quality, uh, shall we say, um, between some some of the shots and some of the images and some of the uh, uh, across the board. But some of them are absolutely fascinating, and they, they, it, there's like shots of I don't know some kind of um, boat trip on the Nile or something like that, and mm. pictures of the crew and, and stuff. And I don't know who these people are. Um, I've, I can just about work out passage of you know, around the early 1900s or something like that. And I'm thinking, if only, if only we knew where, you know, where was that building that they took? Where was that garden that they did? And it, it, all those things that you're just saying there. And I've experienced that. And at the time, you know, the the photographer, just as you said there, whether they be naivety or whatever, didn't think their work it was of any real value. And that's pretty much what I actually think overall of, of what I do. It's it's my hobby, and you know, it's it's interesting to me and maybe a few other people for for a period of time, and then nobody's going to care about it. Well, that's just not true because some time in the future we are making that history. This this social, uh, you know, on a social level, and yeah, if, you, if if it's not permanent in some way, and then permanent is is something that I've I've picked up from watching your documentary. You know, there is a permanence about your work. And and you you absolutely have that foresight of of where your work will be in the future, but you also want other people to have that attitude too. You know, I, I totally get that. 
Yeah, and I don't mean to preach, but I, I go through a um, like a mental exercise with the students. So when they come out, and I've got about six different classes that come out every year from the university and the junior college. Um, these are first year photography students, or you know, or some kind of art students, or graphic design students. And I'll pick someone out of the out of you know out of the group, and I've had as, probably as many as forty five in my studio at a time. And I'll, I'll ask them how many digital photographs are on your iPhone, and they'll pull their their iPhone out of their pocket and they'll say, you know, 4,812. And I said, okay, if we weighed that phone right now and we, and it weighed exactly one pound and then you deleted those photographs and you weighed that phone again, how much is that camera going to (laughs) weigh? And the answer is it's going to weigh a pound. And the point I'm trying to make to the students is that those images on your phone, they don't exist. They don't exist. And I, I know that people could argue and get technical, and and I know that if you got a scientific um, scale, that you they're, 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 there may be those images do weigh something at some point zero 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 um, weight. But the the point is, is that those those images don't exist. And then I ask them, well, why are you taking them? Okay, we're well, taking them to share on social media and so forth. Or, but you'd be surprised at how many digital ph- ph- photographers that I've met that have never printed any of their work. And for me, that's just sad. Yeah. yeah, Simon, what have you been up to? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I'm going to I'm going to keep I'm going to keep my section there pre- pre- pretty brief, brief because um, I think we've got a lot to cover this week. And, yeah. um But what I uh, and actually I've, I'm going to say that my my I've I've sublet uh, my what I've been up to this week out to um, something called Sunny Sixteen Presents. Uh, which is um, there's the Sunday Sixteen podcast, which we all know and love, um, but they have um, recently decided to create a new channel where uh, they're stretching th- the brand. I think is what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> and it. They are. That's what it's called. It's like it could be that. But it's yeah. like if you've got a, bo- a box of Daz washing powder, and you keep the name, but you move into uh, shoe polish. You know. Yeah. Anyway, go on. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, they've stretched the brand uh, into this. They've got another channel now, and uh, th- and this other channel, it, it's it's got content by the uh, four current hosts of the, of the show, and they're doing like solo shows. I don't know if uh, Graham Graham Jago is trying to go solo or not, or just trying to get rid of the others. I'm not entirely sure. It could be a tr- just a trap um, for, to get rid of the others so he can have Sunday 16 all to himself. I'm not sure. Um, but um, there's so, so there are these solo shows where the things where the, the host can sort of go down a bit of a rabbit hole in, in somewhere. Um, but also uh, they're inviting user content uh, or rather listener content, I should say, where people that have got something to say about photography um, can record themselves talking about it and then they'll put it out there so other people can listen to mm. it. And so hmm. it's, a, it's a good idea. Um, I wondered what that was all about because I'm a bit behind listening to that and I didn't even know they had a fourth host. Who's that then? Well, you've got, well, AIDS, AIDS sort of, well, you can say that he's still there, but he hasn't, he isn't really. He's, he's, he? dis, he's disappeared and sold all his analog gear. So, uh, oh. um, yeah. Um, but no, you've got Claire Marie Bailey. Uh-huh. And John Whitmore. Oh, I saw they had been Rachel. doing things. I didn't realize they were sort of now permanent. Yes. They're members. Fixed, they're oh, fixed excellent. Just. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, Graham uh, is do, is just done his show, or rather, he's recorded it, and I've I was part of that. He's I think he's interviewing a few people, and uh, so he I was one of the people they interviewed, and uh, and the subject of the interview was me ordering a chroma camera okay hmm. so i have a chroma um, carbon adventurer on the way and we go into quite a lot of depth as a, as as to why i made that decision um, largely because of going out uh, on two occasions uh, last time with alex purcell and my 75 millimeter lens i don't know if i talked about this last time or not but uh, um my 75 millimeter lens uh, when I put it into the portrait orientation on my Meridian camera, um, even though I dropped the bed on it, it's still like, well, it, it still appeared in the shot uh, completely. No, you told you told me over the phone as you were excitedly telling me that you'd ordered a Chroma <laughs> yeah. Carbon Adventurer camera. 
Yeah, well, it's, it's a it's a it's a need. I need to have it because I can't I can't use my do. wide lens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, and I can't use my my ninety mil to five point six. Was that no? No, I, 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 I'm, I'm glad you've finally taken the plunge and invested in a decent bit of kit, which is well supported, is made by a lovely chap, and he's so inventive. I don't know if you know what we're talking about, Shane. Um, the Chroma camera. No, I no, I've never have no. Yeah, they're made um, by a guy called Steve Lloyd in in the UK, and interestingly, he's. He partnered up with Jason Lane, who you may have heard of. Jason makes J Lane drive plates commercially oh, yes. okay. in the in the USA, and, and they're available over here now as well. They partnered up on a Kickstarter for the first commercially available drive plate holder, and they've landed on Kickstarter backers' doorsteps now. So uh, I have a drive plate holder, it, um, and he's he's making all sorts of things. He's he's making a He's going to launch on Kickstarter very soon a shutter for barrel lenses, Shane. So you know, he, uh, electronic. He's teamed up with a with another guy to work on this. Um, I think it slips over the end of the barrel lens. I think is that right, Simon? And then uh, it it, uh, it, can, it can actually go inside or outside. It, it depends on the on the configuration of the, it, yeah. of, the of the camera. But the the idea behind it is that it uses. Um, well, it's an, it's an LCD shutter that goes either at the front or behind the lens, and it's electronically yeah. controlled. Yeah. So mm. you can um, set it. I think the shutter speed up to about sixtieth of a second. I think it is. Um, so yeah, that could be particularly or, useful. Or, for, or you I, can just use your bowler hat, can't you, Shane? I I, I, ju- I use my bowler hat, but I just had a, I just had a guillotine shutter. Have you seen those yeah. before? I just had a, mm-hmm. an engineer make one for me. Um, remote control. So. Um, the idea was that on some of these larger collaborations, it'd be fun that, you know, if I can get this, get the camera set up and, you know, you have your, your collaborators there and stuff like that. And then I could play these little cameo roles. Like I could just kind of get in the shot somehow, you know what I mean? Just kind of like a funny kind of thing. Um, so it's got, um, it's a guillotine. Um, there's this uh, piece of wood. It's on, it's got some servos. So you arm it. The, uh, the wood sits above the lens. It'll, it'll, he may he mount, he has these mounts for all, for all my different sizes. And I only use Carl's ice test our lenses, by the way. Um, and so for all my different sizes, I got five different sizes. He's got little ring adapters and it's got this guillotine. And so I can arm it. And then I got just this little remote that's got like a hundred yard, um, range and I can just hit the button and it'll, it'll open it and then i hit another button and it'll close it and um, i don't even have to be hands-on anymore so it was kind of this fun little thing but he was this engineer and he over-engineered the hell out of this thing it's on runs on batteries and there's little led indicator lights on it i mean it's just it's it's amazing um i did a little video and put it out on facebook but um uh, barut petrolin um, Uh, from slovenia i was just uh, gonna say yeah yeah i'd I'd got his facebook page up because i was going to butcher his name and he, very, very he, used one, he used one in uh, uh on one of his videos recently didn't he's he? been with me since the early days um did you know he friend. was on our show a few shows back I did you pick that did one? not no i yeah, didn't see that yeah. i did which, not know which that episode no. is that um simon sorry i, I could say again which, which episode was Oof. borat on Bora, uh, Bora root. <laughs> about about it'd be about six months ago, but like, the time yeah. flies this year. It's really hard to work out what's going on. It was during lockdown, anyway. Oh so, yes, it was. Yeah, and it, it was, was just before his dog, just before his dear old dog died. Oh yeah, yeah. He's doing that amazing series of uh, self nudes out in the out in the out in the yeah. forest and stuff he like that. Using that lens. So yeah, he and he inspired uh, the lens that I had made by this engineer that made there it for go. me. So him and I go way back. I mean, I just I cannot. Um, I cannot say enough nice things about my wet plate brother. He's just, he's the man. He's a, so, he, was a, he was a great he, guest. He, he is the man. Give, give that a listen, Shane. I'd recommend that. I, I, absolutely. I didn't, I didn't know that that had occurred. So I will, I will yeah. definitely do that. All right, Simon. So for me, there's never any, never, never any mechanical lens, uh, you know, um, shutters. It's all, it's all manual, all manual here. Well, you, you're looking at certainly outdoors when I was watching you compose those, Tableaus, I think, is probably the best thing to describe there. Everything seems to be about ten seconds or thereabouts. Certainly out- outdoors, anyway. Yeah, it's about about three sec. Uh, F E. So you was it ten seconds indoors? I don't know. I'm yeah, ten seconds indoors. Yeah, some you know sometimes it can get down to one second outdoors. Which I mean, when you get under one second, it's kind of hard to do things manually. But you know, I, it's it's just a little practice. 
Yeah. So I was going to say, just talking about technology, I, I think something something might be slightly loose on your microphone there, uh, Shane. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. You, you, sorry, it was just a little bit of interference there, but I think it's clear again now. Okay. Yeah, that's sorry about that. No, no, no it's okay. Well, well, we'll keep on rolling anyway. Uh, soon after after the mess I made of the opening, um, this is nothing. So uh, <laughs> um, I, was, I was just going to say, um, just to finish off that, that point about my journey into Chroma, um, and if you want to listen to that, that's going to be coming out soon. I haven't, I'm not entirely sure when. It was actually meant to come out yesterday. Um, and what is yesterday for people who are listening? Um, that was the, it should have come out on the 8th of September. Um, so it's going to come out at some point anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, you can hear uh, why I ended up uh, going down that route. So. Okay, so uh, listen, I, I'm a bit behind, but uh, knowing that Claire's full time because I take some credit, you know, because I, I was the one in in the early days when I was listening to Sunny Sixteen. I wrote to Graham. I, it might have been after I met up with him as well. We met up in the early days, and I said, "Are you familiar with the Polaroid work of Claire Bailey, Claire Marie Bailey? She does a lot of cinematic style uh, shoots. She's influenced by um, uh, all sorts of art, art movies and things." And um, it, he went and looked and said, "Wow, wow!" And uh, it got her on the show. So um, mm. it's all down to me. <laughs> awesome. Well, well done. Way to go. She's lovely. That's it. So anyway, that's that's enough about me. So Shane, what have you been up to lately? Um, just in my studio every Friday, um, making plates. Uh, you know, we had the um, we had the lockdown. We were locked down for some months, where you know it was kind of slow here in the studio, and I was taking a lot of portraits. I, I did a pandemic series. Um, pick pictures of my my son and my daughters and my wife and stuff try to with a gas mask and stuff like that so i i, I did that series um and every friday i'm in my studio i'm booked about six months out um trying to get to a thousand native american plates for my uh my my series northern plains native americans a modern wet plate perspective so it, it keeps me busy and um yeah it's it's been uh it's been quite the journey so um yeah, you touched on that, Shane, about your, well, what is your life work? You know, the North American Plains, Native Americans, a modern wet plate perspective. So let's let's formally introduce you. That's probably about time. We've been rambling on for a while now. And uh, I, I I often look for ways to introduce guests. And on your video or your documentary that was made about you, it says here, and I, I hope you like this, apparently you're a quirky businessman in his 40s who was looking for a creative outlet and stumbled upon an archaic form of photography that changed your life's path. Eight years later, your Native American wet plate photos are being archived around the globe and your recent portrait session with Greta Thunberg at Standing Rock Indian Reservation has been seen by millions and is in the vaults of the Library of Congress. Does that sum it up? Yeah, um, I, I like the. Uh, he thought uh, the the two young filmmakers thought that the word quirky may insult me, but I I said no. I love the word quirky. Quirky to me is uh, is a compliment. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been quite the journey over this last. Uh, it'll be eight years here, October fourth, uh, that I found um, wet plate and found a camera for the first time in my life and um, been in, down this path chasing this. Uh, this quest for a thousand portraits of native americans here um being from bismarck north dakota um there, there's a, a lot of tribes that are close here and um and uh, somehow i've garnered their trust and i'm uh, i'm working on this uh, diligently every friday trying to uh, get to that goal of a thousand native american portraits so for, for those who haven't read your book or seen the documentary how did, how did that project start what was the genesis of it and how how has it evolved well i was doing some research um uh, about wet plate and i was trying to look for like um historical wet plate photographers in this area and um 
I found a photographer by the name of Orlando Scott Goff that actually had a studio here in Bismarck. I drive by it every day from on my way home from work. Um, it's on Main Street. It's got, it was called the Blockhouse Building. Um, it was in the 1880s. And um, I found, uh, uh, found out about his work, and I found out that he had a studio over at Fort Abraham Lincoln, which is just across the river. There's the, uh, the Mandan um, Native American Indian mounds over there as well, and um, where the tribe was at, at one point. And I, I found out about his work, and um, I found out that he had taken the first ever photograph of Sitting Bull um, here or around Bismarck, North Dakota. And it, it's kind of an unknown fact, like he's a, like a lost photographic. Um, to me now, he's kind of like a hero because. Uh, but it was like I was the only person that knew about his his work and what he had done, and. Um, so I had spent two years with a historian. Um, we put together a, a journal article about his work, Orlando Scott Goff, and the State Historical Society picked up on it and dedicated their entire um, their entire journal. They'd have a quarterly journal that they do, and they they took our entire um, document about this early photographer that took the first ever photograph of of Sitting Bull here in Bismarck, and they. Um, they dedicated the entire journal to us, and uh, it was in that I found out that um, about my now very good friend Ernie Lapointe, the great grandson of Sitting Bull, and um, he was my first uh, Native American portrait that I had ever captured. So, 135 years after Orlando Scott Goff captured Sitting Bull for the first time in Bismarck, I captured his great grandson Ernie Lapointe in the same process in the same city. And that kind of started this entire this entire journey, and it, it wasn't it was all just kind of organic and, and unexpected and not planned out or anything. It just um, it started with that, and then a few months later, I captured Dakota Goodhouse's photograph and and shared it online, and and it started getting some um, some steam, and 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 then I kind of threw down the gauntlet. I said, "Well, I will um, let's do fifty Native American portraits." That was my initial goal, and I quickly flew by fifty. And um, then it was a hundred, and then at, at that point, I decided, well, let's let's really do something proper, and um, let's shoot for a thousand, which I, I knew darn well that it would take me about fifteen years to achieve, um, and that's where I'm at. So I'm I'm on plate four hundred and twenty-two as of last Friday, and I've been at this for over seven years. Oh, um, it's um, it's taken over your life, hasn't it? Yeah, and but it's brought in so many wonderful people in my life, and it's it's given um, it's uh, it's uh, I think that's what it's all about. Is at the end of the day, it's the relationships that you that you make. These these people come in, and and um, not just my Native American sisters. Anyone who comes into my studio, and they they a lot of them, most of them come in as complete strangers, knowing about my work and reaching out to me, or they're interested to get their portrait done, and then next thing you know they're out there and they, they you know they're here and we spend an afternoon together and and then you form these um relationships and some of these relationships are um lifelong relationships it's it's been rather amazing so um it's it's all about that human connection and uh, for me um and and the trust that can be garnered um when you ask someone to have their portrait taken but it um when you when you first realized that connection with the uh... The first photograph of sit, Sitting Bull. Um, you, you came across a Ernie, is it Ernie La Pointe? Yeah, Ernie La Pointe. Yeah, he was just in South Dakota, mm. um, just about um, two hundred miles from where I'm, I'm at. I found Ernie. him in the fo- phone book. Right, <laughs> <laughs> called him up, and um, I mean, he picked up the phone, and I, I remember distinctly he picked up the phone on the first ring. And um, he had known about Goff. He had he obviously knew about the photograph. This it's a very historic photograph. This is the this is the first time Sitting Bull and, and Sitting Bull had gone on to get his photograph taken hundreds of times by other photographers over the the, the following years. Um, and but this was the first time. It's well documented that the first portrait of Sitting Bull. Um, was taken by Orlando Scott Goff here in Bismarck, North Dakota, my home city. I was born here in 1969. Mm. So, um, you know, it's kind of fun and, and to be able to, uh, you know, with this, this year and a half, two years that we spent on this little, it was the most we, we went all the way down. We found his grave. It was out of state. We got a picture of his grave. I mean, we, we got as much information. Lou Hoffermill was his name. He's a very good friend of mine and used to work for the Historic Society of North Dakota. And, um, 
we, the most we could get was about 16 pages of information. And, and we scoured every nook and cranny of every archive that we could to get that information and to be able to produce this, this document. So if you go on to, onto Google and type in Orlando Scott Goff, um, you will, one of the first or second links there, um, will be the article that I produced. And I went up to the historical society and picked out, you know, they had a bunch of the, uh, scans and stuff, his work and so forth. And it, they didn't have any original plates because his, um, his work, had, two of his studio, his studio had burnt down twice all the way to the ground. So a lot of his work had been lost, but they did have some prints and I would go up there and I'd sift through these and decide which ones were going to go into that article. And, and like we talked earlier about documenting and stuff, some work up at the historical site is attributed to Orlando Scott Goff, but it doesn't have a stamp on the back. It doesn't have a signature. And even though it's attributed um, by the historical society, I had argued that, Hey, unless it's got a stamp, unless we can prove it's Goff, we can think it's Goff. We can, we can predict that it's Goff. We can feel assured that it's Goff. But for, for me, it's not really a Goff. Um, you know, another argument for making sure that you sign and to properly document everything mm. and, and so forth. So we picked out these images and it was part of that article. And it's, it's a rather fascinating article. It shows very early glimpses of Bismarck, North Dakota and, and um he was uh he um he was uh he was quite the photographer and and um it was i always thought that it would be great you know 150 years from now if someone you know discovered my work or found a print of mine and and you know decided to kind of look into uh you know who i was and stuff like that and that's kind of where i fell in love with this this photographer and and wanted to honor him by trying to my best that i could to to piece together some history about him because there's no other peer reviewed document on Orlando Scott's golf life there's no books written there's nothing so this is the the uh, preeminent document that I created with this historian about this gentleman. And it was nothing more than um, to pay respect for him out of the love of photography. The, the, the style of his photos and the style of your photographs are very similar. Was, 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 I mean, clearly you were, um, I don't know if inspired is the, is, is the right word or certainly influenced by him. Is, is that, was that a conscious thing? I don't, I don't think so. Um, I, I find inspiration all over, um, but I, I do rely on painters and previous photographers and stuff to to get inspired. I think it's in, and hopefully sometimes my work can inspire someone else. Um, I, I think there's a lot of that going on where you you get a feel um, for people. Ask me, I've asked many times where where do you get these ideas and these concepts, and I just don't. Um, I don't know where it comes from. I, I think it's not, uh, it's being without any kind of art form, not being an artist and, and any regard for, you know, 44 years of my life before I found my camera, that it's just kind of like a lot of pent up. Um, I, I've always been visual. I've always, but it, it didn't occur to me that I was visual until I started doing photography. And, and then it was, there's always been quirky things that I've always paid attention to or something would bother me visually. I, I, I there's a lot of things visually that I, I'm in, tuned with that I really didn't put two and two together with until I started creating visually. And then, then it, it seemed to make sense. So I, I think I've always been a visual person. Um, and, um, but I, I get inspiration from all kinds of people, but I, I think, you know, and going to answer your question a little bit, the people talk about, you know, why, you know, why these your wet plates, um, you know, why do they feel right? Like why, do, you know, when you take these Native American portraits, because I'm using the, the, the historic process and, and those were the first ever photographs of Native Americans that, you know, we, 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 we saw back in, you know, as we were traveling across the country, um, photographers were sending stuff back from the, you know, the frontier. And um, when you, when you don't play, when you're actually using the same process, it somehow it just gives you what you need. I mean, I, I don't know if that makes sense. No, it it it, it does, and I, I've really appreciated it as well because one of the, uh, if wait, it's it's slightly uh, connected to it. Uh, one of my pet, one of my pet peeves was we've done pet pe- your pet peeves. So it's, it's, yes, it's mm-hmm. one of mine, <laughs> um, and and that's when you see photo when people are, are taking. I mean, I, I don't I don't like to criticize other, other people's photography. It's something I you know I think you know if you enjoy it, fine. Yeah, you know, and that's all that matters. You take your photographs for yourself, but there's a there's a particular genre that really gets my goat, and and that's where people are taking perhaps digital photographs of reenactments such as Vikings or some kind of fantasy 
uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, what's that? Uh, relative, that television series that finished recently. It's a bit like Vikings, a bit of fantasy and stuff like that. And they, 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 they take in Game of Thrones. That's it. And, ta- yeah, and taking these digital photographs of, of these, these 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 scenes, and then sometimes they might decide, to, well, let's just try and make it look old now. And I'm thinking, well, what's the point? What, you know, <laughs> you know, if it, there, were, there were no photographs, there were no cameras then, it was never going to happen. There were no cameras then, yeah, no. You, know, you might be a, a quick at drawing, and that's as good as it's going to ever get, and then you can go back and try and re- recreate it in your head and with, with some oil and, 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 and so on. And whereas what you're, you're, you're doing is, tie, is very much time-specific, and it's and it's just so right in the way that that kind of stuff I've just been talking about, in my opinion, is just, just so wrong. So I really well, appreciate what you do there. You'd be surprised, Simon. Uh, you know, surprised at how many people don't know when photography really was invented. You know, they don't they don't understand. You know, eighteen thirty eight or so daguerreotypes and then the wet plate process. I mean, you know, so I, I, I've run into a bunch of people that you know were thinking that you know people from the seventeen hundreds were photographed, and that's just not the case. So. Um, you know, photograph is, a, it's a rather new technology. And I mean, if you, if you go back 165 years, I mean, um, what an invention it was. I, I, I sometimes think people miss how big of an invention, um, photography was for the human, for the human race. You know, before that, you, you'd have to have a painting done of you or something. I mean, there was, there was no visual records other than paintings or drawings and sketches and stuff like that. So, I mean, photography, when, when, um, Frederick Scott Archer in, in, in The Chemist, that, that uh, scientific journal, um, wrote that, that document. And it's not a long document. I've got a copy of it here. It's only um, maybe six, eight paragraphs. Um, I mean, he, he was uh, showing the world uh, photography. And, and it wasn't that long ago, if you really think about it, you know. Yeah. It, that's, that's, that's another thing. There's... Uh, you know, we're talking about cutting edge um, image making, and they were done. You know, and, and it was people like Goff were taking photographs of uh, Native Americans, and and that that's famously one of the one of those places where the the stories come from, where you can't take a photograph of me. Uh, because it's going to do something to my soul and that kind of stuff. I'm probably paraphrasing quite badly there, but that was that, no, no, that's. No, that's- Ernie Lapointe wore a talisman around his neck to protecting himself from my camera. When did I took his portrait, did he, did he say it had a, a bit of his? Was it his? Was it his grand? Was it his great grandfather or somebody? It was protecting him, wasn't it? Protecting no, his it's, shadow. It's, it, yeah, it's a it's a little rock. It's a rock that has um, some spirit form that's important to him, and um, I don't I don't pretend to understand. Um, I can just, he, this man has taught me a lot. Uh, I've learned a lot from him and, and you can just sit around with Ernie and just listen to him and tell stories. And, and in his perspective, he's a Vietnam war veteran as he? well. Um, when he, um, I don't, I don't think he'd mind me sharing the story when he, he came in and he wore his, uh, his feather. It was one of my first lessons, you know, it, it, when you, when you're, you know, when you're completely an idiot about a culture, like I was, and I still am, um, or naive. Um, and then you, you know, you get immersed in this culture and you, um, you know, I've got my own native American name now and stuff. Um, but when Ernie came in, um, he had his Eagle feather on the back of his hair. And, you know, obviously I was, I asked him, I said, well, okay, you know, should we stand up the Eagle feather? And, um, he said that that's not proper. Um, that, that, um, that his involvement in the Vietnam war and stuff like that, um, his Eagle feather had to be down, not up. And, Mm -hmm. um, there's just little things that you, but you have to ask and you have to be respectful and you have to have an interest, uh, uh, an honest interest in, in the, in the history. And, and there's so much that I don't know, know, but I need to learn. Um, and, but it's, it's been fascinating, but he's, um, we, we talk on the phone probably once a month and uh, to this day, and, and he's been into my studio four times and he's always supported me. He's been up here when the documentary came out and the book came out and, um, it's just been this wonderful journey. And, uh, but the, the lesson is, is that how photography can bring us together like it's this it's this common ground um you know what i mean like uh, the 
the relationship that can be formed by that that little time that you're together making portraits and and the significance of those relationships can continue long down down the road after those experiences together so well, why is photography that you know why, what is it about photography that 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 lends itself to this this kind of relationships being formed and i i'm not quite sure i have the answer to that but i do relish in it i do appreciate it and i'm aware of it so um i, I think that's the important part is just trying to be aware of it but um uh, ernie lapointe there's a lot of things uh, uh he can teach all of us T- took a little while to gain his trust i think of it didn't it from when you first made contact with him? Yeah, well, he didn't, he, um, you know, here's a stranger. And I mean, mm-hmm. he, he gets quite requests all the time for his time and stuff like yeah. that. And, you know, he's got to make determinations on who do I give my time to and who's worthy and who's not. And, and he just, um, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll tell you himself. He just kind of like, um, you know, drove all that way, came up here and, you know, he didn't know what he was getting himself into. He didn't know me, you know, we were complete strangers. So he had to have some kind of faith in me, which is kind of weird. And it was only on one conversation. Do you know what I mean? Like you're going to drive 200 miles, 250 miles one way and back, and you could get up here and, you know, nothing could transpire or, you know what I mean? Like this could just all be for naught. And, but he, uh, he trusted in me and, and, and that's the other thing that we should, you know, we, we, I've learned over this time, especially like the social media and stuff like that is that, um, a lot of these relationships that you, you can, um, you generate online. I've never been let down when people like, for instance, if you, Andrew and Simon, if you ever came to my studio or something, I, I, I have a hard time feeling that I would be let down with, you know, with, uh, you know, having you here, like these relationships, they're still relationships. I know that we've never met. We never shook hands, but like Barut, I, you know, you just heard me talk fondly about this gym. man, man, I've never met Barut. I was supposed to meet him this May. We were going to European clothing weekend. Barut was coming to see me and in the other wet plate artists in the Netherlands and it was canceled. So my, my chance to meet my wet plate brother was um, thwarted. And it was, it, I think it was like the hardest, the hardest part of that whole cancellation, that trip is that I knew I was going to get to see him for, uh, finally. And, and I didn't get that opportunity. So we're, we're talking about next year, hopefully. And, um, but these relationships with so this, I, I've never met Brute, but he's, I mean, the guy's, he's just amazing. And, um, so there, there is some value there to, uh, you know, to social media and, and it gives you, gives you opportunity to meet people that you never would have met. Mm-hmm. Just like you were explaining in that pub or whatever that you, you know, it was hard for you to find some traction with people that had similar ideas and concepts and thoughts and stuff. It, it's really hard if you, if you don't have that connection and, and social media, it, it, there's a lot of bad things that go along with it. Um, but the, what I, you know, I try to focus sometimes on the positive and what I do find out is that it's opened my work up and has brought a bunch of people into my life. I mean, how would I, I never would have been able to find the, the number of Native Americans that I have right now without social media. I mean, I share my work and, and people see it, they appreciate it and they contact me. I mean, how else am I going to um, I get my sitters? So it's, it's, it's a wonderful tool if it's used properly, but it, it, there's a lot of bad, there's a lot of downside to it as well. And there's a, a lady who I think helps you sort of acts as a bit of a go between and helps get the best out of the city. Is that, is that Margaret? You Margaret? Know, yeah. Yellow yeah. Bird. Yellow and, bird. Yep. She's, uh, I consider her, um, she's my sister. I consider her my, my collaborator, my, my one main collaborator on the series other than myself is where early on she had, um, come in for a portrait and I did a portrait of her son. And then, um, she just kept saying, Shane, can I come out? And she said, I got this uh, next person. Can I come out? And so she was instrumental in in breaking down, um, you know, those barriers or those walls and in, in, in allowing me to have this trust. And, and now that I've, I kind of found my own stride, um, you know, it, it's it's amazing because uh, but early on, it, w- it was very instrumental that her, you know, her trust in she'd come in and she'd make sure that um, she was teaching me constantly. She was making sure that uh, all the all the regalia was was properly portrayed she would look at the back of the camera with me um you know it was it was a true collaboration some of my favorite m- memories of the series is with margaret with me and even like when deb Haaland, the first native american congresswoman came in and uh, you know margaret was there by my side um and it she's just she's a wonderful lady and and i owe her a, a lot for her friendship and and again but it she was a complete stranger she came into my studio and and um here we are together still 
I think this might be a good time to talk about the the documentary that we referred to uh, a number of times. It's, it's, uh, I've, I've got to say, I'm I'm better prepared for this interview than I am for many uh, because I've watched an hour long documentary uh, about yourself and and your work, and it was fascinating uh, to watch. And you know, some of the things you're, you're talking about there with the the congresswoman, I know exactly who you mean now because I've I've seen. I've seen her, and, I, and uh, there was a scene in there where you, you're giving her a gift, and she breaks down, and it's it's just incredibly touching. Um, it, there's a scene in there where Margaret is there too, and she was running late. See, the congresswoman was supposed to arrive um, the day the night before, and we were supposed to have three hours with her, and then her pl- her trip was her plane was canceled or something like that. So she was arriving at 10 a.m. We had the book signing at one, and I had to get portraits. I had to get her all the way from the the airport up to my studio, and you know get those portraits. I got a portrait from her historical society in her home uh, state of New Mexico. I got one for my my series here. And there's a point in this the documentary where I, I tell Margaret, I said, you know, the book signing's great, and you know I'm glad Deb's here and stuff. But what's most important is the pictures we have to get the pictures if if the, if this whole thing can go to crap but we have to get the pictures because nobody's going to remember the book signing 50 years from now but everyone's going to remember the image that I took of Deb Haaland and I took three three images that day so um you know that was important to me it's it's always about the image you know it's always about the image and you you can see that in the documentary where I'm, I I look th- like very worried because I, I, you know, I'm going off to the airport to get her and we're in such a time crunch and I'm under all this extreme pressure to actually ch- capture this little piece of history. I mean, she, a Congresswoman flew in from, from Washington DC specifically for my book signing. I mean, I don't, I mean, what an honor. I mean, I can't let these people down. Now, not many of us have had a documentary made about us. <laughs> Um, I don't know about you, Andrew. Have you had a documentary made about you? Uh, not yet. No, no maybe no, next year. This, this time. Um, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, you know, how, how, how did that come about? And, you know, and perhaps if you can just, just tell, tell us more about the documentary as a whole. Because, I mean, like I say, we both watched it and it's excellent. But, you know, if you want to let the listeners know a little bit more about the genesis of it and what it's about. Yeah, so the documentary is uh, my last name, Balkowicz, B-A-L-K-O-W-I-T-S-C-H. Um, I had nothing to do with the documentary. Um, it was not my idea. I'm um, going back to the relationships and building rapport again. And in these relationships that we've been talking about this afternoon, um, Chelsea uh, Sivarelli um, was a, a one of my first sitters that had ever come in, and a young lady that trusted me and came in. I took her portraits, and and um, she had gone. Uh, she went to school for video and photography and stuff like that, and and she got to working with a gentleman by the name of Greg Desay, and they were working at the same company doing uh, visuals visuals and stuff for this this company this large corporation and um he wanted to do like a five minute short um document that was their idea they were gonna do a five minute little documentary and so chelsea again she knew me and she had been in my studio numerous times before she brought greg in and he was here for like four hours he watched me create on on a on a friday i want to say and by the time he had left, he says, we're going to do this documentary. And, and the five minutes turned into, you know, a half hour and the 45 minutes to an hour. So for a year and a half, these first time filmmakers um, with no budget um, decided to follow me around for a year and a half and document what it, it was I was what I was doing here. They, they, they thought it was that um, they thought it was interesting. And, and, and um, but it was going to be a short and it turned out to be a, an hour long documentary. And um, it's uh, it was a, it's amazing collaboration because, you know, that them shooting film, that's that's their medium. And I'm shooting my wet plates. And I, I always tell them, you know, the documentary is not a it may be about me, but it's not about me. It's about your work. And I've, I've always it's always been important to me to remind them that you know the documentary is your work and i had no say whatsoever in any part of that documentary which i which i adored i i didn't want any say in it i wanted them to do their thing so it was in the can um when i went over to his house for the first time and saw the whole thing laid out and it was like 92 minutes or something like that and then i had that opportunity with greta thunberg and they had to actually open up the can again and get some more footage and add an additional like eight minutes to them in the documentary. Cause we kept having these little, these little um, 
events that they thought were important um, that needed to be in the documentary. So we just, they just kept adding on to it and adding on to it and moving things around. And it f- finally got up to like a, an hour long. Um, so that was, um, that was launched, uh, you know, this, um, this last May is when um, it was uh, launched for the first time. You can find it on Amazon in some countries, or you can find it on Vimeo. If you just search my last name, Balkowicz, and it's, it's got a bunch of good reviews. They an award for a very spirit award at the Fargo Festival. They won for the documentary and <clears throat> excuse me. It was a huge honor, but it wasn't, again, something very unexpected. I, I wasn't planning on when we we shook hands, it was going to be a five minute short and it turned into a feature length documentary and um, yeah. they covered a, bun- a bunch of stuff. And they, they did a great job. I mean, it's when you, when you say like, you know, they, they, they're young filmmakers, they, they, weren't particularly experienced by by the by the sounds of it, and you you watch you watch it the way it's filmed, you know the the way the music's put in, the way it's edited. It's absolutely excellent. You know, it's it's you know, zero budget, exactly. zero budget. I mean, how do you? I don't I don't know how they pulled it off. You know, I don't know how they pulled it off, but they did, and I, I'm I'm grateful to both of them very much. Yeah. Well, there was sorry, Andrew. I was just going to say you got Evander Vander Holyfield in as well, so that was that was fantastic, wasn't it? Yeah, that was uh that played is at the Smithsonian Institute. So um I had Virgil Hill was a pugilist, is a is a a boxer, an Olympic boxer from North Dakota. Uh, again that that the, you know that local connection. So I had known about Virgil for years and and I don't I don't remember how I got Virgil into the studio, but he was going to come in for an hour and uh, Virgil ends up spending um it, probably the 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 biggest name boxer to ever come out of the state. He ended up spending like four hours in my studio showing me how to wrap my hands properly so that I don't break my fists if I got into a fight. And it was just an amazing afternoon. And so this hour turned into four hours and he just got, he completely immersed himself in this, in the, taking these portraits. And, um, and I've told this story before, but as he was leaving, he shook my hand. He says, I'm going to get the champ out here. And I said, what the f*** are you talking about? And he says, well, I'm going to get Evander Holyfield, the four-time heavyweight champion of the world, into your studio. And, and I, I said, well, bullshit. And uh, we left it at that. And um, it was some three, four weeks later, I got a phone call. Um, Evander Holyfield was coming in for Virgil Hill's final fight. <laughs> um, he was having a going away fight. And Evander Holyfield was flying in because they were um, Olympic. Uh, they were roommates in the olympics together um so they were very close friends and uh so the the call the phone rang my cell phone rang i was at my daughter's volleyball game and the phone rang and the person on the phone said the champ will give you an hour if you can pick him up at the hotel in 10 minutes and i said i'll be there in eight and um sure enough i pulled up the hotel evander holyfield got in my car took him down to the studio and it was just, um, I mean, right from where I'm sitting right now, gentlemen, there's a, there's a chair that's sitting here. It's called my, the Evander chair. It's the actual chair that Evander Holyfield sat in. There's a little label on the bottom of it that says the date and says Evander Holyfield sat in this chair at Nostalgia Glass on this date and stuff like that. And it's like my most, if this place burns to the ground, I'm like, I'm grabbing my Evander Holyfield chair and running out the door with it. <laughs> that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so I had, I had an hour with Evander Holyfield and, um, um, it was it was a remarkable it was a remarkable experience and and the fact that the the, the plate um, got to the Smithsonian into their portrait gallery is 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 a huge honor and uh, um, yeah so that's how Evander Holyfield uh, came into my studio but again it was the re- the rapport and the relationship and the friendship and the kindness that I showed towards uh, Virgil that um, opened the doors up to something bigger. You know, you never, and I say this a lot, you, but you never do something to get something in return, but it, it's amazing how sometimes things come back on you. Yeah. No, that was, that was, I, I really enjoyed that, that section there and, and the, the, the image that you made, um, mm. absolutely excellent. And it, you know, you, you talked about how you, you had an idea about what image you wanted to, to have and, um, and just, you know, you were braving yourself up to ask him to take his shirts off to get the, uh, to get the, sh- the shot him off. It was, it was agonizing. It was agonizing. Like, how do you convince the, you know, how do you approach asking the heavyweight champion of the world to take his shirt off? And he was, is all for it. And the other thing that was kind of telling about him and his, um, you know, who he is as a person 
we all know about the Mike Tyson bite in his ear, right? Um, so he's got that scarred ear. And I, I did another portrait of him, a side portrait um, of him, a profile shot. And I gave him the option. You understand, this is in my old studio, which is just uh, in my warehouse out of my office. So there was no windows at all. It was all just light fixtures. It looks like, like an industrial building. I mean, um, you know, Evander Holyfield's coming into this just, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know what he was thinking coming into my studio because it was, it was not much, I, I called it my makeshift studio. Um, but I asked, I asked him, uh, you know, what side and I was, you know, just crossing my fingers that he would show me the ear side, you know, yeah, I wanted to get a picture of the damaged ear side and, you know, but, you know, there was a chance that he would want to shy away from that for some reason. I didn't know, but I mean, he was all for it. He says, no, I want to, I want to show this side with my bad ear. And for me, it just likes, you know what I mean? Like yeah, it spoke vol- volumes mm-hmm. about him. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it, it spoke volumes about him. It's like the scar or whatever. And he knew the history behind it. And, and, but he's not, he doesn't shy away from it. You know, um, it, it just meant, it meant a lot to me that he, he uh, trusted me to uh, shoot that, that side and show his damaged ear and where Mike Tyson bit him. Yeah. There's, I mean, I could, I could see why you, why, why you'd be nervous about that because you just, you just don't know if, if that's something that, it would be difficult for him because he, he wouldn't want people to see that or as was actually the case he was actually well not sure if proud of it's quite is the, the right word but what? certainly it, he's accepted it as part of who he is and uh, how how people see him i think it's how you go about it you know if i would have just told him which way i wanted him to be you know maybe maybe that would have offended right but i asked him it was a collaboration everyone that comes into my studio it's always a collaboration i'm always asking it's never sit down shut up and let me take your picture i know what i'm doing right i'm always like all my guests like if you come in and there's other people here everyone's looking under the dark cloth with me everyone's looking at the ground glass i'm showing everyone it's just it's just it's just this like experience that we have together so and i'm always taken in someone will say well do do you mind if i change that or can i do that or can i adjust that and um it's always yeah go ahead and do what you want to do so it's never it's never all uh, always about what i think or what i want to do it's a collaborative thing so when you ask you know i involved them i said oh, you don't you know i'd like to take a side profile do, do what side would you prefer and and he made the decision and I, I, you know, we had the conversation about the year and, and he gave that to me. So, so it's, it's again, trust, you know? Yeah. There's a, there was another um, section where there was, there was tension. In fact, it was, it was, it was excitement was building uh, in one part of the, of your uh, documentary. And I, I don't actually know what the, the, the scene was called, but uh, I know that there was a, a character in it called Lady Liberty. And, um, and Liberty uh, Treasure Sue and Justice was the name of the piece. That's the one. And, uh, and watching you organize and and make that photograph was 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 it was brilliant it was just brilliant to watch that because the stress you seemed to be under was enormous yeah eight eight months and fifty two collaborators to pull that off um and and I think the stress i I get into this mode when I'm creating um where I just like everything else just kind of fades away and I just get so focused and I don't even like when I saw the documentary for the first time I asked I turned around they paused it and I said is that how I am and they said that's that's how you are every time you're behind the camera and I and it was just like this watershed moment it was like realization that I didn't realize that that's how I behave you know what I mean like with that um that kind of intensity well the, um, bit, the, but, the bit I was gonna say the bit where you you come running out with the uh um, I can't remember the word. I don't know if you uh, with the the, the, like the film the was sensitized. Um, yeah, the plate holder and the in the plate, the live plate. That's live it. Plate. Was, live plate. Live plate. Live, and, yeah. Which, <laughs> and, and that's that's exactly like me in the kitchen when I've made something really good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's uh, and and I, you know, in all honesty, you know, some of the urgency. I don't know where the urgency comes from, but it, it, it I believe it comes. It's all stemmed from not wanting to let those fifty-two people down, right? I mean. 52 people, no budget. We, we put – and, and any, any of your listeners can go to a Liberty Trudges Through Injustice wet plate, and you'll find the page, and it'll show all the behind-the-scene images and stuff. And, and that plate is blown up um, 10 feet across and is hanging in downtown Bismarck um, on a wall of an art gallery, on the exterior wall of an art gallery. And um, 
I, do, I just don't want to let anyone down. So the, the payment that I do for all these collaborators is we all just get a signed print. So as many collaborators as there are, I make limited edition prints and everyone gets this really nice print. And, and so nobody gets paid anything. I don't make any money off it. Everything, we got zero budget. Everyone, everything there in the picture was brought by someone or made by someone. I got a carpenter. We got, got hair and makeup. We got, uh, you know, it's just, uh, we have a seamstress. It's, it's just an amazing experience. So we missed our big collaboration this year. And so we're going to do, we're going to do one based on the plague next year, which, um, I'm really excited for in August. So how, probably be about 75 people. How did you go from, quite intimate portraits to because I, I was watching you know you these intimate photographs you're making and suddenly you're creating your you're a movie director that's what it seems like and it's like a set i mean honestly when you come if you came to one of these large collaborations it feels like a movie set and i've never been on a movie set but i i just i get that feeling i mean hair and makeup and then you know what i mean i got it i got a director merrick merrick Deuce from um he's the film um um, professor out at the University of Mary. He's my director and he, he coordinates, you know, he's putting everyone, he's got the, he's got the visual and we've talked for our, we've already had a meeting about next year's shoot in next August. We've already had a meeting, a two hour meeting on uh, what our concepts are and we're putting stuff down on paper and what elements we need and everything. So it's, it's got everything that a movie set has. And, um, it, it's, it's, uh, to answer your question, it's about the need to collaborate about I, I found this huge value in collaboration that um, when people come together from different disciplines or different perspectives and you collaborate, just like with my Native American series, it's a collaboration. Um, it's, wonderful things can come out of it. And I, and, and I get to, I get to focus on what I need to do with these large collaborations. And then I get joy out of watching everyone else do what they get to do. And then at the end, it, all that matters is one image. We work all day. We've worked eight months. We've done all these planning, countless meetings and, and props and, and carpentry work and all the stuff that we do to get that image. And then when that image appears in silver on glass, it's just like this huge reward for all of us. And because all of us and, and everyone's name who's involved is, gets put on the back of that plate and that plate goes up to the historical society. So, you know, um, we're talking, you know, a little bit about history again. And we are playing, you know, the liberty trudges through injustice, but look at how that applies these days you know like look at you know my my lady liberty mural downtown bismarck was egged by some guys who did not want me to put a, a greta thunberg a thunberg mural up in bismarck so i mean um, my mom happened to be going to the coffee store and looked over at my my 10-foot mural of liberty treasures through injustice and um they egged my um my art um downtown here in my own hometown and not only did they egg it the actual egg was on my my daughter Abby and my son Grayson were in that portrait. Um, that's who, who they actually targeted. So it, the egg was on my children, uh, my minor children's um, bodies on that, that piece of art. So that kind of, um, kind of, uh, um, I don't. I, I, I'm having a hard time for words. Uh, yeah. How I, I'm having a hard time for words. Yeah, no, it's, that's a, a, a horrible thing. I mean, we were talking earlier about uh, social media and how uh, it can be a force for good and uh, and it's it's helped you uh, create the the body of work that you've uh, you've created with the Na- native americans and um, there's 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 there is the other side of it and and you know in, in many cases people experience the negative side of social media just uh, and and that sort of it you know, it, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make it easy to deal with for, 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 for many people, but you've actually, um, suffered it in a, in a, in a very physical sense as well. And, and you've already, you've touched, touched upon it, the, uh, you know, where this, 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 this anger, if you like, um, against, uh, yourself and, and what, what, what you've done went with, uh, one of what I, I, w- I would call it one of the famous, most famous photographs of last year. Um, that that you took, um, and that was a a photograph of Greta Thunberg, um, and uh, standing for us all. And uh, I think it's an absolutely incredible photograph. And but just anything that surrounds Greta, um, con- con- controversy and and just 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 follows. Um, there's lots of polarized views 
on uh, on climate change um, and what she stands for, and the fact that you know she is going out making a very loud noise, and she's done it in a well pre in the pre COVID days at least anyway. She, you know, she, she was getting a lot of attention, and a lot of people didn't like the message that she was giving. Um, and do you think that's where the where that anger came from? Well, I knew that, you know, I had knew I had known that um, it was, you know, that she was controversial. Um, I, I've always believed in her message, and when so I have um, Murder's Gulch, which is my big, big my first big collaboration, is up in um, is behind a restaurant here in town. It's a ten foot um, Murder's Gulch, which is actually based on a historical location here in Bismarck, North Dakota. It was called Murder's Gulch, where there's actually fourteen people were killed over certain months in this bad bad neighborhood and it was my uh, it was our reenacting trying to kind of bring back to remind us where where we came from and then lady Tr- uh, liberty trudges to injustice uh, was also installed um in just about 150 yards away and they're large installations and and there's they're part of the downtown art scene where people will do tours like tomorrow i've got to go in they're going to do a tour downtown with the uh, one of the art organ associations and i'm going to go and walk around with them and t- talk about the art and stuff and and students go there and i get all these pictures people will come through bismarck and they'll they'll get a picture with liberty um and they'll send it to me on facebook and say look i, I came through but i drove an extra 100 miles to so i could uh, stand in front of your piece and take a picture for you and and they, so there, there's it, it's become um, you know it, it's it's a huge honor and they got classes from the different um, you know schools grade schools will walk over there for their art classes and stuff and, and stand in front of it and and it's it's really kind of fun to be able to do that um, so I was going to um, do my next large installation and these are gifts by the way um, this isn't um, I'm not drawing from. Um, any state funds. I'm not drawing from any art association. That's also important for me is that I don't, um, I'm a rather fortunate man. So this is, uh, these, these, these are gifts. I'm fully funding these myself. I, I'm not taking from other artists, no one else. This is me funding and, and people supporting my work. And I was going to put um, Greta Thunberg standing for us all. Um, again, a portrait that never would have occurred unless I would have gained the garnered the trust of the Native Americans because it was at Standing Rock where I actually captured her. So it was one phone call down there, and that was my in. Is that the, the, the Standing Rock Nation? Um, they know who I am and what I'm about, and they gave up 15 minutes of their time so that I could do this and, and capture a little bit of history for North Dakota and for the reservation. And so I was going to install Standing for us all, um, and it was. Um, I, it wasn't even installed. I mean, it, we were about to get installed. I was. I had the meeting with the city. The city had already approved it and said, "Yeah, Shane, we, you know, we have your other two pieces up here. You're, in a, you know, you're, uh, you know, we value your art, and and yeah, there won't be any issues." And someone leaked the minutes from that meeting um, online, and um, someone posted on social media, "Is this appropriate that um, we allow Greta Thunberg?" a Greta Thunberg mural to be installed here in Bismarck, North Dakota. And it was a bakery, a new bakery that had just opened up um, within the year. And they were all excited about the portrait and everything. And then they started getting threats and then um, um, boycotting. They said they were going to boycott them out of business. And um, then, the, then my mom found the eggs on my Lady Liberty, which is just across the street, by the way. It's just within 50 feet of where this installation, this new installation was going to go. And um, they had egged Lady Liberty. And um, so I could not let the, the business take that on the chin. I mean, I can take one on the chin for my work any day of the week and I have, and I will, and I have no problem with that, but I couldn't put this new business in harm's way. So um, I pulled the, uh, the application to have it installed here. And then within about six, six hours of that, this whole thing kind of, you know, the egging and stuff was, um, you know, made the news. We were on the front cover of the Bismarck Tribune, I think four times with this controversy. And then, then all the people, the residents, some of the the people, some of the leaders, like the the president of Bismarck State College, um, came to my aid with an editorial in the paper. Um, Clay Jenkinson, a historian here, came to my aid in a in a large write up as well. Um, the Fargo Forum came to my aid, and then uh, Mike Williams from Fargo, North Dakota, said, "We'll take Greta." 
And so within six hours of me canceling Greta and Bismarck, um, Greta was going up in Fargo and she's there today. She's installed now there. And since then this whole controversy. So instead of the one portrait, the one art installation at, um, in Bismarck, we got Fargo, then we got New York and then we got Standing Rock, a portrait of the same size portrait went to Standing Rock. And then we were, we're going to Maryland. So I'm just accepting the uh, the art print next week. And then that'll be shipped to Maryland. So there will be four installations around the country of Greta Thunberg standing for us all. So it's a little bit of a vindication at the end. But, you know, it didn't it felt like a real big fight when, you know, um, there was egg on my art and you know there was a local facebook group um and i won't even mention their name but they they called me a nazi and um <sighs> well uh, do, do you know why they called me a nazi i can't imagine why no <laughs> cuz cuz i own a 1965 porsche 356 okay and and <laughs> um, very very poor a ferdinand porsche um <laughs> built the people's car which was uh-huh. the volkswagen yeah. for hitler so yeah. you don't you don't see that association Good grief! I mean that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't ring true to you. I mean you can't identify me as a a, a Nazi from that. Well, well, now you point it out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean it's, it's rather glaring, isn't it? It's rather obvious, right? Good grief! So there's an art, online article about Shane Balk, which is a Nazi, and <laughs> and it was like for for what for for giving a mural to the city of Bismarck. You know what I mean? Like, what was my crime? What did I do wrong? What, what I, I took a. I took a portrait of a young lady that came to Standing Rock. I mean, did that not happen? I mean, is that not part of history? And what's funny about that is I've said this before, is that all these prints and these art installations. And, and, and by the way, the, the Greta was attacked with eggs in Fargo, by the way, too. So it was she was up for about a month and a half. And, and someone, we had video and the police were doing a, a Try, had a search for a guy. We had a picture of him and everything standing with his little carton of eggs, and he's sitting there just throwing eggs at my 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 installation in Fargo, um, which destroyed the the print. And I had to we had to take it down and reprint it and put it back up, but it wasn't going to thwart us. But I, I've always said is that these these things aren't my work. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not my work unless it's you know it's the glass plates. So my gla- my work is they didn't vandalize my work per se. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, how are you going to vandalize standing for us all with Greta Thunberg? It's in the library of Congress (laughs) in their vault. I mean, go ahead and try to, you know what I mean? Like that's where the real work is. You're not vandalizing my real work. You're vandalizing of representation of my work. And, and that's, that's kind of how I I push back. And in fact, there's a a portrait I did. It's did a self portrait, the anonymous egging of an artist where it was fun. I another collaboration with my daughters. I brought my two young daughters, um, Olivia and Molly. They were six and nine at the time. I brought them down to the studio with a carton of eggs, and I, we just sat here. and I said, "You get to put eggs on Dad's, <laughs> smash eggs on my ha- hair." And they were like, "What are you talking about, Dad?" So I had my camera all set up, and my other daughter Abby came down and took the lens cap off, and she they smashed all these eggs. And I'm holding these eggs in my hand, and there's egg whites running and yolks running down my shirt. I'm just standing there. It's called an anonymous uh, egging of an artist. And it was my way of pushing back because they can't um, – they don't They don't have the weapon that I have. And my art is a weapon, and, and I can wield it. And I've said this before. I can wield it at will, and it's something that they can't take away from me. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a couple of things there about um, art as a weapon and, uh, and possibly um, why some of the people perhaps – I don't know if they were waiting for an excuse – uh, to to take it, have a go at you, but there's a a shot you did. This one. I can't shouldn't be saying shots. I should say a a a photograph that you made. Um, <laughs> yeah, then certainly I, I've seen it here, and it was uh, posted on Instagram, uh, and it's, it's in the documentary as well. But it was posted on Instagram on the 26th of January 2017, um, and it's um, it's called Trump uh, POTUS revealed. Mm. And it's not it's it's not very flattering, is it? No, um, very controversial image, um, and it was a way of me as an artist standing up for my friends um, down at the Dakota Access Pipeline, where where the protests were. So, um, I had had Native Americans in my studio that had been bodily injured, like a young lady had come in and she had lost her eye um, to uh, you know um, 
to the 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 um the issues that we're having down there um and these were all unarmed native americans um they we, you know the the police and so forth shot fire you know water cannons on them and the you know when it was below freezing in the middle of winter um trying to disperse them and um so when um, our president was elected, um, I was the first one to say, well, he was elected. Now, you know, the people spoke and let's give him a chance. But one of the first things that he had done is that he, um, we had, I shouldn't say we, they had won the, the um they had one down at the Dakota Access Pipeline that they were, they had to do an environmental survey and everything, and and they were it closed down. They they had actually won that fight, and it was like a year and a half struggle. Like so, I was having these Native Americans come in in my studio that had been on the front lines um, all this time fighting against this pipeline because they did not want it there. And one of the first things Trump did with an executive order with a, a swipe of a pen took him two seconds. Is he just pushed that through? And when that happened. Um, I could feel the collective consciousness of all my friends. Just, I, I just felt like the, the wind go out of their sails because all of this work, they were out there uh, in the middle of winter fighting and, and fighting for this and, um, you know, standing up for what they didn't want. Um, and uh, he just with one fell swoop approves this. So I, I did POTUS revealed, which, um, which um, was just my way of uh, there's, if you look at the image, there's a, there's a skull there with a, with a, an eagle's feather um, representing my Native American friends and, and what I was feeling that he had done to them. And he's got oil spilt all over his shirt. His crown is kitty wampus on his head. He's got a, I don't know if you notice, he's got an Adolf Hitler mustache on. Um, he's wearing some torn pantyhose. Um, yeah, um, we got dollar bills at his feet and not regular dollar bills. Those wouldn't be good enough. We got these big, huge, oversized dollar bills that are at his feet. And there's still coins on the table and, and there's a lot of visuals there. But um, again, it was just my way of, uh, you know, I think uh, not our, all artists have to have uh, a point of view or have to use their work in, in some kind of way to get a message across. But I, I certainly have found um, – I have found that it's important for me. And I, like I said, um, I, I wield this, I can wield this at will. And um, there's, uh, there's really no, uh, no, um, no stopping it. And you lost a few followers as well, but yeah, about 800 that day, but that's who cares. Who really cares? I mean, who's counting? (laughs) (laughs) I think, um, yeah, it's, it's a tradition, isn't it? If you've got, if you've got a voice and you care passionately about something, then use it, you know? And so not everyone's got a voice, buddy. Everybody's got a voice. Everyone's got one, but not everyone's got, you know, no, no, uh, some people don't, you know, they, they feel like they're voiceless. Mm. Like they, they feel like they can't get heard. Right. Yeah. So when you're handed this or you, you know, you're, you're given the, um, the privilege of having, um, you know, um, a voice, um, you got to speak up. I mean, you just got to speak up. And if there's any, like, before we even had this conversation, if there's any agenda of my work, the only agenda is, um, you know, be nice to each other, compassion, have understanding, tolerance. These, the, uh, 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 that's my agenda. So I, how, how can you have a problem with my agenda? Hmm. It sure isn't hate. No. Hate's the enemy. It's the enemy of my work. So, um, it's the enemy of my work. Hate is the enemy of my work. Let's let's just take a little uh, break there. Um, I, I, <laughs> Are we doing okay? We're doing mm. more than okay. I mean that yeah. that was that was it was really really powerful, and and I yeah. think both Andrew and I don't really know how to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, it's, it's always it? easy, isn't it, to make some kind of almost glib, glib comment, but it wasn't appropriate, you know, and um, or some smart comment, you know, because it was a powerful point and really well made. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I hope I'm giving you guys what you want. Yeah, I mean, you I've done, I've yeah. done a, a few podcasts, and I just I don't want to regurgitate the same shit. You know what I'm saying? It's it's um um you know, and, and you guys are, um, you know, you guys are drawing something out of me. So I don't, and I, yeah, I hope it's not getting too dark. Is it getting too, no, no, I feel, I feel no. like it's getting too serious. No, it, it's it, this, this, this is the, you know, we t- touched upon it before. You know, it is the, and you've, you've, you raised it as well with the, with these long form 
uh, unscripted, undirected uh, conversations, they can and usually do go absolutely anywhere. And it's it's one of the joys of actually making these shows that you, know, mm. you, you you learn things about yourself and you learn things about other people that you just that you thought that you knew. And and but you know, I've I've learned a lot today um about the the plight of native americans <coughs> and, and and also it's just reinforced my views of certain parts um of america as well unfortunately yeah you know, that's that's bad news but there you go that's that that's that is how how it is and yeah you know, when you made the point there about you know he was he was democratically elected um yes there's flaws in the system but yeah you know, the fact is that's the system it worked and you accepted it because I um, mean that that's something that winds me up a little bit when I I don't know if uh, this is going to if you could, this will you'll agree with this or not but I really dislike uh, these things where people were saying you know not my president in this case of well he is you know whether no, you like I, it or not I, I, and I I'm honest with you I was I was the fr- I said it my I said it I said he's elected we got to give him a chance exactly that's that's an exact point. The other thing I wanted to run by you guys real quick, and I don't, you know, I, we can talk real quick here and then get back to it if you want, um, is that one of the things that I'm trying to do, the Historical Society, in documenting my work and, and my images and stuff like that, they're always asking me for additional content, like, um, you know, newspaper articles, stuff like that. And and if you guys are comfortable and, and um with that if i if you guys could provide me like it doesn't even have to be the edited form but this this entire even like when you started recording at the first so we weren't even actually on if the whole thing where i could actually i would save it to my drive it would go up to their yeah. archive and it would be i would put your guys's names and today's date and the name of your podcast on it and it would just go into my digital archives and it would go with my work and you know someone may you know 50 years from now pull from that and 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 go back to these conversations of um, that we had together and, and it wow. wouldn't be you know it would never be um never used by nobody um you guys always obviously keep the rights of everything but it would just be like i'm almost giving them a digital i'm just giving them the digital audio and it i like it unedited too yeah. you know what i mean like even this yeah. conversation here so that and it just goes up there and it's just part of the and they they have it in they'll put it in their digital archives with my work so they have this they want this volume of um things um they just don't want the work they want they want to some of the documentation behind the the scenes um and um i do little audio recordings every once in a while like when i did greta thunberg i did like a 25 minute just sitting here with a recorder recording they want my bowler hat they want my first wet plate shirt with all the stains on it they want my first camera these are all these things that are in my will that are going to go up to the heritage center i was going to say did you say you say you got to wait till i'm dead before you can have my bowler hat yeah, yep. It's it's in my will that um, these are – seriously, they asked me for these things. So it's like they said, well, we want your shirt. And I go, what are you talking about? Well, that, that shirt that you wear, that stained-up shirt. And I said, well, f- the things – you know, it's it's falling apart here. So I took it off my body and put it in a frame. It's in my dark room. So when you guys come and visit sometime, you'll go into my dark room and here's a shirt that is framed on the wall. And my daughter knows upon my death to go grab that f- shirt grab my camera grab my bowler hat and she has to take every plate my kids and my my wife they get to each get three plates their favorite plates so each each family member gets three plates and then all the rest of them go to the heritage center so i'm donating the entire thing upon my death to um um to the, to the history here. So my point is, is that this audio content that you guys are making today for me could be part of that supportive yeah. documentation. And it would well, be a huge honor for me. Well, it would be for us as well. Yeah. Is it, um, you refer to the historical society and I, I, I'm a bit ignorant about these things. And sure. you've also referred to Smithsonian, which I know is some kind of institute. And that's where your plates are going, isn't it? Your portraits of the native. No, Americans? no, no. No, there's, yeah. there's a difference there. So, okay. um, the, the North Dakota, the state historical society of North Dakota, it's the, it's our state. So we have the 50 states here in, in the United States. So our state funded museum our state's museum the largest museum you know we have all the history of north dakota that's where all my native american portraits are going i have 22 um 22 different archives including that that have my work there's some in france i've got one in india there's you know the smithsonian has my the only plate that the smithsonian has is evander holyfield the Uh only plate that the library of congress has is greta thunberg so i have these specific plates that go to specific have gone to specific um, gotcha. institutions but the state historical society which for me is it's really important is that because that's where i'm from right i was born here right mm-hmm. i was raised here and yeah. what, an interesting story is that um 
when when I, they first took the first ever plate to ever go into the historical site in North Dakota, under, you got to understand what a what a um, an honor this is, right? Like how many photographers are in the state of North Dakota, right? Thousands, right? There's thousands of photographers, right? And how many of them can say that they get to put their work in the historical society of North Dakota? I don't know anyone else. So I mean, how, how do I find my spot? You know, how do I find myself in this place? So you don't take it for granted. But when we first started, they took the plate of Ernie Lapointe and there were some other plates that they wanted. And, but they always had to have like a meeting. Like they say, okay, what plates do you want to give us? And I'd say, okay, this one, this one, this one. Okay, we'll have a meeting. We'll let you know if we're going to take them. Cause obviously it's expensive to curate them. And you're talking about curating for indefinitely. Hmm. So at the historical society of North Dakota, there's actually a, they call it chain shelf. So you go back in the vault, the climate control vault, and there's a shelf that has all my work on it. I can go in there and it shows every, all these plates. And these are the original plates. I'm not doing, I'm not talking about prints. These are the original glass plates. Um, I donated to them. And so they, at first they had to get everything approved. And then Evander came in, right? And the State Historical Society, it was like on a weekend, it was like on a Thursday or whatever, I found out that the, 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 the library, I mean, the, the um, Smithsonian Institute, is going to take Evander Holyfield, the portrait gallery, one of the most, probably the most prestigious portrait archive in the world, you could argue, okay, is going to take Evander Holyfield. So on that Monday, the the president or the, you know, the director of the Historical Society sent me this nice little email and said, um, by the way, Shane, as of today, we will take any work that you want to give us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if it's good enough for the Smithsonian, it's good enough for us. So, so here, but he, you know, it's, so it's those baby steps and those relationships, right? So here they were like, oh, we got to approve this, we got to approve that. Then the Smithsonian decides that they're going to take. They put a twenty five thousand dollar value on my plate, and they sent out a climate controlled v- truck to come collect it. They sent me this box, and it's a double box, and you got to put it in here, and you put the labeling in there, and you, you seal it up with this special tape, and we're going to send out a truck, a climate control truck, to pick it up from you. And when the Historical Society of North Dakota heard that the Smithsonian Portrait Gallery was taken by plate of Evander Holyfield, then it was like, we'll take it. And then, then it opened up the doors to my creative work, right? Now, all of a sudden, I could give them liberty, liberty trudges through injustice, right? Yeah. I could give them POTUS revealed. I can give them they were they'll take so I can sneak in, you know what I mean? Like, oh I got I want a picture of my daughter in there, I put a picture of my daughter in there. Um so it's like this huge honor, but I can never take it for granted. But I mean, how many photographers do you know have this kind of you know, this this honor of of someone saying, After you're dead, we'll take that. We're going to take care, you know, 300 years from now, your great, 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 great grandkids can show up here and we will bring your work out and show it to them with white gloves. I mean, who, who's, who has that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So Andrew and Simon, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm absolutely f- blessed. Simon, I know we're not podcasting at the moment, but you've got to find some way of just getting some of that back in there, whatever, using your editing skills. <laughs> yeah, there's, um Yeah. There's there's some good stuff in there, and I, it, it wouldn't seem it, well. Yeah, you couldn't really just just relive it. No. Relive that now. No. no, no. Okay. Well, I, I got to tell you something. I had a I had a conversation with uh, like eight months ago. I did a small podcast for this with this this. Uh, it wasn't even a podcast. It was a twenty minute interview, and um, I had this conversation. I got really heated, and, and you know, I got really um, animated about it, and. At the end of the podcast, it wasn't a podcast; it was just an interview. At the end of the interview, she says, "I forgot to hit the record button." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling you guys, I, I, I almost fell off the chair. So then she said, "Well, let's try it again." Yeah. And we went back at it, like you know. I said, "Okay, well, I got you know, we can do this 20 minutes again." And we went back at it, same questions. We couldn't get to it. We do, we, we had to quit. Yeah. I said, "Why don't you just call me in a month?" Hmm. And we'll do it again. I and see. then I can reset because I don't feel like, you know what I mean? Like it's, I'm just, I'm just like, it's just, it's either naturally there. I, I can't, I can't, no, we, I, I, I couldn't get to the magic. I couldn't no, get to, she, she was t- so happy. I totally, totally get it. And as somebody that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I do the recording I, and obviously I record this and I, I, I have the other podcast that I do and I do the recording for that one as well. And on, I don't know, probably about five or six occasions. I mean, I've, I've done, uh, probably about 180 podcasts between the, the two shows. Wow. And 
I've done about five of which where I've completely messed up the audio. Um, and a couple of times it's, uh, it's, it's at the start. And I think I did that actually with uh, the podcast I did last week for the Classic Lenses podcast. And uh, we got about five minutes into it and I realized, sorry guys, this is really interesting, but <laughs> we've got to start again. And the, the, and that was with the guest as well. And when we started again, it was a completely different conversation. It was still an interesting conversation, but it was it was a completely different conversation. You just you just can't you can't recreate those things. You you can, and that's what I argue about my work is that um, you know if I take your portrait, I can never recreate it. I can never recreate it again. That moment in time, that ten seconds, that. You know, that, that movie, these aren't photographs, these aren't snapshots. This is a movie. This is a 10-second movie superimposed, a still life superimposed upon itself. All that life is there, and we can go into the dark room. we can see that image appear, and if something happens to that plate, I can sit your ass down, but we'll never get back to that again. We can never – I can never – you can be in the same – I can – same lens, same camera, same day, same light coming through the windows, same everything, same chemicals. Everything. It doesn't matter. Same person. doesn't matter. I can never get to what I created with you 20 minutes ago, ever. And I've learned that. And, and so it, it kind of reminds me that this is special. Like, this is the moment. Like, this is a moment in time. And I think with digital photography and how fast, uh, you know, photography has gotten in these exposure times and stuff – uh, I think we 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 forget that it's actually a, you could argue that a snapshot is not any part of your life. It's a blink of an eye. It's one sixtieth of a second or one three hundredth of a second. You can argue that that none of my life is captured in that image. But when you take a ten second exposure, and that's why I swim and I live and I I relish in these long exposures. When I'm taking these longer exposures, you can not you cannot deny that a part of your life is not on that plate. And, and you know what? I was that was that was you've said something there that um, reminded me of something. I was I was again. I think it was part of watching the documentary, and and it was one of the longer exposures uh, that you had. And the 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 model, I think it was a female model. I think, um, and she had to she had to hold a a pose for a I don't know, maybe call it maybe ten seconds. I'm not sure if it was quite that that long. Um, but the the final image you're going to get out, it, it can never be truly, utterly sharp because nobody can stay perfectly still for that length of time. Yet the actual image is sharp, but it's not sharp, but it is. And, it's, it's, <laughs> and that's something you just don't get. You can't get that in the way that you've just been describing there with that blink of an eye where you get everything sharp or the specific areas you want to get sharp. And if you try to do something in Photoshop or whatever to try and get a, a collodion look, if you like, and, you know, there's, there's some, I've seen some filters applied to some collodion, uh, to, yeah. to digital photographs. And I, in fact, the first time I saw one, I thought, wow, that's great. And then actually, no, it's not. And and it's it's those those subtleties, but it's that life of somebody actually standing there for ten seconds, and and you can see that, but you can't see that, and you can you can't quite put your finger on it. That's that's I think what that that for me is what you're talking about there. There's blood coursing through your veins. You're actually you have to breathe. You're taking a couple of shallow breaths. It's all there. It's all there, and um, it's it's magical. It's magical. It really is, and that's why I don't. I don't. I could get instant. I got brothers and sisters in wet plate that get instant photographs with with flash units. I mean, you can get instant photographs. Um, I don't. I got. I got a big, huge five thousand watt Belker unit that I could supernova going off in the studio and get instant uh, instant wet plates. I have. I tried it twice. I have. I have no interest in it. It's um, there. There's something about these longer exposures. Um, and uh, there's the involvement. The, the the sitter has got to be involved in the portrait. And like I, I had some people criticize my my portrait of standing for us all that it's not that sharp. And I'm like, do you understand that this this 80 pound girl, 16 year old girl, standing at a 20 mile per hour wind on the open plains with no head brace? And we had a you know we had a three second exposure at f8, and you want more sharpness than I can give you. You don't understand what I'm working with. You don't. You don't even understand. You don't understand the process. And you don't understand photography. If that's what. If, if if sharpness is what you were looking for in that portrait, I don't. I don't know how to help you. 
that was a manually controlled lens removal. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I um, my my other podcast is called the Lensless Podcast. Shane, it's all about Pinel photography, and pretty much everything you've said um, relates to that as well. In you know, Pinel photography is about capturing chunks of time. And when you poke large pinhole, chunks of time, large chunks of time, yeah, I, 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 I made a pinhole out of a uh, out of a beer can and sat. Absolutely. You know, I, yeah. I took a picture of a church for you know sixty days. Yes, uh, exactly. I, I've had a beer can up on the wall for, on the drain pipe for six months recording the sun. Um, but you point it at just a you know with normal film in at the sun, and you capture you capture the sunbeams. I know that's really weird, but you're capturing. You can see. It's not really the sunbeams, but it, for, for for the world, it looks like sunbeams, you know, and it must be the light diffracting through the through the pinhole. But you, you can just see these streaks of sunlight, and and you, you know, clouds become light, you know, streaming across the picture, and people can either be slightly moving, or you can get rid of people altogether, or you can just capture them moving in two places, you know, and that's and I, that's. I that capturing chunks of time is a fascinating area. It's absolutely fascinating. Do you know how long it takes a photon of light to um, escape the sun? Um, no. <laughs> well, photons, it, you know, in the in the, the reactor in the in the center of the sun, right? Yeah. It takes uh, approximately one million years for a photon of light to escape the sun. So you have light bound in this reactor. A million years bouncing around, and then for whatever reason, boom, it's on its way to Earth. What is it? Eight minutes later, it arrives here, bounces off our subject's faces, activates silver on a glass plate, photosensitive silver on a glass plate. Do you know that um, silver and all the heavy metals are not native to Earth? Yeah, they're from the stars, aren't they? From They are. There's never yeah. been enough energy here in the creation and the formation of Earth to create any of the heavy metals, nickels, platinums, gold, silver, none of them. They were all brought here by celestial bodies colliding with Earth. So all these portraits on my on my wall, when people come in, they're actually just looking at stardust. That 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 their image is captured in stardust. And we're all stardust, understand at the carbon level. But my point is that those heavy metals, and that's why when you go to Alaska, there's you can find gold there. You go to San Francisco, and there's gold there because it, it, it's not just because it's random. I mean, it, it, it's because these these bodies hit Earth and scattered this 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 heavy metals that had to be made in in the explosion of a star. So you think about these, you know, these are the romantic things I think about is a, a photon of light and a million years to get here. You know, a million years. And then you talk, you, then I'm making images out of, out of a substance that shouldn't even be here. And how it got here is absolutely amazing. I mean, it's absolutely amazing how, how it was transported here. And then we collected it. We made silver nitrate out of it. I'm making pictures out of it. And now your picture is you, – there's a reflection of you in a photograph that I've made that will be here a thousand years from now unbroken. I mean, if that doesn't get you excited about um, photography, and, and, and going back to your pinhole, I mean, I, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm an anti gearhead because, I mean, the pinhole example is the, you know, if pinhole camera is the perfect example of, you don't need gear. I've seen the most beautiful pinhole photographs, and there's no f-ing lens. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so, what are we? Why are we chasing all these, all this gear? You know what I mean? Is it necessary to make an image? It absolutely is not, hey, and I could, I would, I would argue it's counter, counterproductive in many, many instances. Yeah, it's almost another podcast, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I mean, we certainly it's it's a subject that we've we've touched upon on the on on, on quite a few occasions, and yeah. uh, uh, I'm I'm a serial serial bad uh, serial offender on. Uh, I'm being made to feel quite bad now. Uh, about, about, no, no, no. Uh, but we all we all want the, the the latest gizmo and stuff. You know what I mean? We do. I mean, it's 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 kind of human nature. But there there is something um, there's something religious about sticking with the same equipment. Do you know what I mean? 
There's yeah. something mm-hmm. religious about it, about the same instrument. And it, does, it doesn't have to be photography and the lenses and cameras and stuff like that. It could be, you know what I mean, um, an analogy I've used before is a golfer, you know, using the same putter for 20 years. Um, you know, the same chef using the same knife for 30 years. Do you know what I mean? These kind of things occur. It's not just about our art. It's about, you know, anytime you have a craftsman with the same instrument in their hand for an extended period of time, I happen to think something special is going to come out of that. Yeah. And that's why I stick with my Carl Zeiss Tessars. I just don't, I don't, I don't have an, I've got brass lenses here that are a thousand bucks on the wall that, that are 150 years old. I don't use them. I don't mount them. I look at them. They're pretty, but I don't use them because I can't get to my work. I'm a simpleton. No, if um, you, uh, I, by everything you've said, particularly with trying to keep it simple. I mean, I struggle, I do struggle with that, but, um, you know, it's a philosophy I buy into for those very reasons, you know, for you know, familiarity with the equipment, you know, then, then once you're so familiar with it, then it becomes irrelevant to the image making. Second nature, right? Second nature. Yeah. And, and, and and when you look at, the, just think of, you know, just both of you, just think of an important, uh, you know, a, a photograph, a, a photograph in your, that you can recall, and I'm thinking of one myself right now, and you don't really, you know that photograph, right? But you don't really care how it was made, do you? Do you no. care what format it was? Do you no. care what lens? Do you care what process was? Was it digital? It doesn't matter if it's digital or analog. I mean, I'll, I'll argue, digital. You know, analog's king all day because just that's where I feel I have to do. I just, I mean, you're you're talking to an analog photographer. That's what I do. I mean, I'm, I, but I'm not, I'm not knocking digital photographs. I, I've seen so many wonderful digital photographs in my life. My point is, you don't, you know that image, whatever image you're thinking of, and do you really care how it was made? You don't. You don't really care I, who I, made it. I, a lot of people I, do on social I, media, I was, don't they? Well, I've got to say, I, I've, I, I do have to have the, the contrary point there because, in, <laughs> it, certainly in my case, I, I, I really do. Um, but that, that, that can also lead to a far wider question about why, I, why I have so many cameras and so many lenses. Um, but I know that I've taken images because of the equipment that I've used. And I know that I've taken images that I could not have taken in any other way. Um, so because of those two things, yes, the, the, how I took that photograph is in many cases, in fact, it's probably too important to me. Um, sometimes it's, it's the, the process is far more important to me than the output. Um, so I may have things a little bit skewed there. But that shows, you know what I mean? Like that, that you're a gearhead. You're, you're, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm like, I'm going back to, I'm a simpleton. I don't, I don't know any other process. So my point of view is, this is my point of view. It, there, there's no right or wrong, right? But it's just my point of view is that I, if, if for me, it's all about the end result. Yeah. Nothing more. It's all about the end result. And yeah, you know, do I know that Ansel Adams used a Carl Zeiss Tesser at one point in some photographs? Yes. Do, does it matter that I know what kind of paper he put his images on? I don't. I'm not sure if it does. And, but, but there are there, there's geeks in this world, right? I mean that 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 relish in all these. You know, when I restored that car, you know what I mean. There's I, I know I, I fell into this um, into this uh, community of people that were restoring cars and and they just know every little aspect of everything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's the same kind of thing, but is it, but at the end of the day, is it, a, it's just my point. I'm not, I don't, I'm not taking exception. I'm just saying at my point is at the end of the day, do you like the image or not? And, and for me, that's what it's all about. And however I get to that image, I could give two shits about. I don't, it's just not, it's not that important to me. It's, if, did I get to the image? And it doesn't really matter what I had to do to get to the image. Did I get to where I wanted to be? And if I got to where I wanted to be, the image should stand on its own. And having all those, you know, we talk about the documentation and having all, what lens did I use and all that stuff. I mean, that's all great. To, that's all gravy on top of that image. It's, it's nice to know all that particular information. What size of camera was it? Yes, it was Shane was using a, a, a Ghibellini from Made in Italy camera, an 8 by 10 studio camera. I mean, you know what I mean? Like those are all little, those are little um, icing on the cake, but it, it doesn't matter though because I've, I, you know, that beer can can give you an amazing 
image that beer can, which would be someone else's garbage. I mean, that that was a, a point that uh, Dave Shrimpton, um, a, a previous guest, probably I don't know, about maybe about five five episodes ago, uh, and he, he's he's similar to me in some ways that you know he does he does like the gear, um, but is also. Is, is probably closer to you, as in he's, he's a true artist. Actually, I think the two of you have connected before, I think. No, yeah, I've, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I'm very familiar with his work. I've yeah. got, you know, in that archive uh, or that exhibition, the permanent exhibition, I've got I've got a, a, one of his pieces on, on display in my studio as, as you're talking to me about this. So here's that little community again, this little small – the world's a lot smaller than we think, right? Exactly. The, uh, where, where I was going with that is um, when we had him on, um, his favourite camera is his pinhole camera that is, mm. you know, he made out of. A, I don't know if is it a tin of soup or something. I can't. Or is it? No, he makes um, he makes pinhole cameras out of coffee tins and illy coffee tins are good. Illy coffee tins, yeah. screw top. Mm. Yeah. But there's a specific, oh, yeah. yeah, there's a specific one that he has. I can't remember which one it is. I don't think it's a coffee one, but uh, but the point being is that he, he he loves that, and you can see why because the images that he produces mm. from this really simple piece of kit are just extraordinary. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it just, it's, it's, yeah, it's about the image and, and it's about, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm getting, I'm getting lost for words, but um, I'm not, I'm not, I, I hope you don't see that I'm, I'm putting down people that collect no, gear no, no. and are technicians. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm I don't, not I don't even worry. know what someone, someone asked me about ISO the other day of wet plate and, and I don't know anything about ISO. I mean, I don't, I have no concept. I mean, I understand that it, it has to do with sensitivity, correct? Yeah. So, um, you know, one of my, my friends said, uh, well, the ISO is negative on wet plate. And, and um, you know, it's like, okay, um, what am I going to do with that information? You know, it doesn't matter to me, right? It doesn't, and maybe that's why I, I don't even consider myself a photographer many times is that I, I, because I know that there's guys like Andrew and Simon out there that are actual photographers. And here I am, you know, lurking around in your guys's pool and, and I'm just doing this thing. And, and it's, it's not as much photography because I don't know all the, I don't know all these technical things. I don't know all the gear like you do. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like I'm just, I'm just chasing the image and it's, it's just my perspective and I'm just naive in a lot of ways. Um, and, and, um, and I've only gotten here by trial and error. That's the other thing. You know what I mean? Like it could have probably been if I would have had one of you guys around and show me the way around a large format camera, I'm sure things would have been a lot smoother, but I, I, I somehow, um, I somehow find myself, you know, getting along anyway. You know what I mean? With all just just trial and error, not 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 knowing, not knowing. I don't mean to be ignorant, but well, I don't I don't know about Andrew, but I don't think I could have taught you much. <laughs> so, no, I mean neither. No, um, and I I think, and I haven't a clue how I'm going to be doing the editing on this <laughs> uh, because yeah, we, we start the podcast. Again. Yeah, we we yeah I, press, I did press record and we went we went we went somewhere and now that's part of the show, um, but. I, it's, it's 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 all good, and uh, I think that we should start to bring things um, uh, to an end. Uh, how and um, and I, actually, the first thing I, I want to say is uh, there are, we do have a couple of emails, and we will get to them. Um, so yeah, that 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 will happen. Are they the uh, same same two emails you've been? No, I think we've got another one now. For weeks. Yeah, we may have another one now. We may have to do one of those those email shows. Yeah, I think we've only got three emails. So I mean, but even so, you know, they they they're good, and we want to uh, want to give them some airtime. Um, so, um, Shane, thank you very mm. very much for spending the time with us. Mm. Yeah, it was it was an honor, Andrew and Simon. I, I'm just glad to be uh, you guys thinking that uh what i have to say is of any interest and um i you know i support and i i cherish large format photography and um I, it's an honor to uh be in this uh this time creating with uh, all the other large format photographers well we're 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 honored to there's no two ways about it um I just just before we do things like shout outs and things like that i just want to say thank you to uh two people that have supported us since the since last time um on coffee.com and the first one in chronological order is bill persons and he left a message and it says uh thoroughly enjoying each episode particularly the last five episodes so it sounds sounds like we're on a bit of a roll at the moment andrew well, 
maybe we just it's a bit like using the same camera all the time you kind of get used to it don't you and you look no, i mean i'm not a, i'm not a professional broadcaster for goodness sake you know and you can't always see what you know when you're not sitting in a room with somebody it's a lot harder in many ways you know you, you, there's no body language you can't often you can't tell when um yeah. Where, where, sh- should I say something or should, shouldn't I say something? You know, we're, we're not professional. No one's talking. We're just doing this out of the, out of the love of the medium. You know, I wouldn't be doing this, you know, doing it to get paid for goodness sake. We're doing it because we love, you know, I do it because I love analog photography. And if we can put something back into the community through this, through this medium, then that, that's, that's great. I, I love doing it, but, um, you know, the more we do it, we, we must get a bit better. Surely. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, trial and error exactly yeah, mainly error um, mm. and um, and we also had a donation from here we go uh, Aram I, th- I, I really need to know what these strange things are above certain letters and what they actually mean and it's not I'm not talking about an, a dot above an I um, um, have have a have a now Okay, I'm really sorry again. And the reason why I say really sorry again is because I'll read the, the message that came uh, with this. It goes, I'm donating again just to hear the sheer, the sheer hilarity of Simon trying to pronounce my name. <laughs> Um, I really need an audio. Uh, please, please, Aram, please send an, an audio of yourself saying your name. Um, we, we, who knows? Why even play it? Um, Aram, he's he's deliberately butchering it just so <laughs> you keep sending money. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, he's, he's put on there. Just kidding. Um, yeah, are you? Um, um, I have thoroughly enjoyed the last last couple of episodes. So uh, no, we're well, down to two now. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure about the last five. Certainly, the last two have been good anyway. So uh, that's that's universally accepted that the the last two episodes were good. So uh, thank you very very much, Aaron. And uh, I hope this episode is uh, is is meeting both yours and Bill's uh, standards. Um, Anyway, um, shout outs. Um, Andrew, have you got any shout outs this week? As it happens, yes. Yes. I'm not sure he wants me to shout out or not, but I'm going to. So we have a shout out for Colin Devereaux, who um, sent us an e- a message out of the blue, really, saying, You don't have a Flickr site, do you? And I, I think I responded and said, No, we have one for the Lensless podcast. And I do. I do give it some attention, but and I like the format. I love Flickr. I think it's a great way to view your view your images, and if you're going to put them somewhere, you know, um, digitally, then that, that's as good a place as any. Um, so he said, "Well, can I run it for you and set it up, and I'll put the show notes on and links to the episodes, and try and get a conversation going for people who don't like Facebook, because Shane, we have a very interactive." Facebook group called um, Large Format Photography Podcast Facebook group. Mm. But not everyone digs Facebook, do they? Because for lots of reasons. So, um, yeah, we're now on Flickr. Well, when I looked, it said it was to check back in later, but um, it's, it's, it's going to be there soon. It's, it, it, it is there. And is it? we've actually got four members somehow. Well, me and you are probably two of them. Yeah, that, yeah, we are, and uh, and Colin is uh, clearly the third member. But we have a <laughs> some, somehow somebody, uh, Joseph Brunges. You're renegade. Yeah, yeah, Joseph Brunges. Uh, oh, well done. Plate. There's another wet plate. We should call ourselves the Wet Plate Large Format Photography Show, shouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have we had a, a, had a bit of a run on wet wet, wet plate, definitely. But uh, but yeah, so uh, a wet plate as um, as as uh, as is, is in the group already. Um, I have no idea how we find out. <laughs> I don't know if you're just waiting, waiting for the group to be created, and then it appeared one day, and he and, and thought, "Yep, yeah, this is it." But, um, I'm glad I waited for that now. So, uh, well, welcome, Joseph. Um, any any other shout outs, uh, Andrew? Nope. Okay, uh, Shane, have you got any shout outs this week? Oh well, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Greg and Chelsea, the two filmmakers that put that uh, documentary together for me, uh, out of the kindness of their heart with zero budget. Um, chasing me around for a year and a half probably was not easy, um, and I am I'm proud of the work that they did, and um, I hope it uh, um, it speaks volumes about uh, what I'm trying to accomplish here uh, in the future. I, I think it's a documentary that'll be poignant even 20, 30 years from now about uh, what it was I'm trying to do here. 
So it's wonderful when um, other artists and collaborators uh, do things for you and unexpected things for you. So I, I want to thank both of them from the bottom of my heart. Well, they, they did a great job. And actually, um, I have – it is available on Vimeo because that's where I found it. But now I have actually, while earlier on in the show, while Simon or you were talking, I did find it on Prime Video and the whole hour nice. thing is there. I just typed in Shane's surname into the – search and it came up so uh, i've already i've already sent it to my daughter was that on a computer then or no it's on my just on my iphone as i was sitting i think it's is it free right there in the uk well, for I, some reason i think there was a yeah, special I, they were doing. it even started playing so you know i have oh, amazon i have you guys are set i have prime yeah. video and so everyone else is paying like 5.99 if they're buying oh, it elsewhere on Amazon. So I think there's the U- Amazon was given a special deal or something for it um, in the UK. Oh, so yeah. I, I'm not sure if it goes other parts of Europe, but um, yeah, if it's free there, that's uh, that's really cool. Well, that's I, nice. I, I, I oh, actually, yeah. I, I and, well, now now sorry, Simon. Now I'm doing it, and it's just the trailer. <laughs> ah, yeah, I've seen I've seen that. Um, but I, no, it came up. Sorry, it came up as I was talking to you, as as you guys were talking earlier, yeah. and it said fifty nine minutes, and it started to play. So uh, try and find it. Just go to Amazon and see if it's there. But otherwise, you'll and if, and if you can't, if you can't find it, they can just go to Vimeo and type in Balko, yeah. which again, it's B A L K O W I T S C H. <laughs> easy for you to say <laughs> um, as i as i demonstrated earlier right at the top of the show um and uh i'll i've got a shout out to the six downs dark room which is now up and running again um although um we're limited numbers not that that was actually that much of a problem um but um, if anybody wants to come along and have a go at uh uh, or just have a chat to us. But uh, if you want to have a go at doing something in a dark room, whether it be processing or uh, enlarging up to five by seven negatives as well, um, then just get in touch with me uh, via the usual ways. Of on, on and I'll I'll give my contact details after. So uh, if you fancy coming along to that, please do. You'll be more than welcome. Um, and another re uh, re shout out for Graham Jago of uh, Sunday Sixteen Podcast and Sunday Sixteen Presents uh, for putting up with me for a, a while earlier on this week. So uh, thanks for that. It was it was good fun, Graham. And so, and I can also confirm again that it is on here. I'm now watching it. Fifty seven minutes to go, um, and it was free. Well, I mean, I pay seven quid a month for it. You know, for Amazon. Prime oh yeah, video. But, yeah, but yeah, okay, yeah. yeah but, so no, the movie, the, yeah, Prime you, is free. Yep, if they yeah, get if Prime, you press okay. the right button, it says play movie. So first of all, I was getting the trailer, but now I'm, I'm actually watching the movie now yeah. on my on my iPhone. Well, I, I tried to get it going via um, Virgin Media, and it, I couldn't find it mm-hmm. at all. So nope. uh, perhaps okay. it's, it's a different, yeah, a different platform is viewing it in a different way, perhaps. So. Uh, so that, anyway, that's one of those things. So um, I'm now wa- I'm now watching Shane play his vinyl records. Analog, analog music. You got analog <laughs> photographs. You got to have analog music. You certainly have. No, yeah. no, no digital music streaming in the studio. No. Um, so Shane, if people want to, and I'm sure they're going to, um, to look at more of your work that that's out there, uh, I know you're out there in quite a few places. Um, do you want to go through the ways that people can follow you? Yeah, they can probably the best way is just to go to Google and just type in my name, last name again. I've spelled it numerous times, and then um, just put wet plate behind it, and you'll get um, um, you'll get my website, my Native American websites out there as well. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of articles written, and and I've got a uh, if you want to talk about analog versus digital, I have a. Um, I also have a uh, an interview that I did on TEDx um, about three years ago. I think I did like twenty minutes to talk about um, digital versus analog. Did you hear that? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah it's, uh, okay. Um, so there's a there's a TEDx talk out there, and and then if you just look in the on Google, just click on the um, the images, uh, it'll show a, b- a bunch of my work. But I think if you get to my my original website, um, you there's you can look at my work. I've got little tabs there by year, so you can actually see me uh, progress. It's always been kind of important for me to um, keep some of my early work out there, um, as I'm you know other people are coming in and trying to learn wet play and and they'll say comments like well you know look at your plates compared to mine or something that's like they've only been practicing for three months it's like hold on a moment and then i send
send them, I show them this link to the, my first images and then they feel good about themselves. <laughs> so um, it's always been kind of important for me to kind of leave it all out there on my sleeve, showing uh, my progression as well. So you can go all the way back to 2012 when I first took my first images and if you can stomach those images. But um, it, it, for me, it, it's 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 good to remind myself how far I've come, but it also, I think even more important, it, it reminds me how far I yet ha- I have yet to go. Um, Andrew, how hmm. can people keep up with the kind of things that you're up to? Um, well, I'm lurking around the Facebook group most days. So that's on the large format photography podcast, Facebook group. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Warboys Snapper. And then every couple of weeks or so on the Lensless podcast. I, sh- I should have mentioned um, I also run um, Friends of Frederick Scott Archer on Facebook, which is um, there's about 3,400 of us, people that are interested in wet plate photography. So if some of okay. your large format photography um, listeners uh, want to see some um, modern day wet plates uh, by fabulous group of people, um, artists that want nothing more than to share their work with others, um, Friends of Frederick Scott Archer, and Frederick Scott Archer was the man who invented this um, and wrote about it for the first time in 1851. So if, if that, that's another good Facebook group. Uh, and Shane, as well. Shane, regarding your book, um, I, I know it. I know it's available on Amazon um, because I've just seen it. But is it available from you direct as well, or does it not matter? Or I've uh, I've yeah, I've sold out of the um, my my artist version, my limited edition version, yep. the first mm-hmm. thousand copies. So you can get the trade version on Amazon. So yep. um, I think it's on quite a deal right now i think you can get like for 24 dollars, and it retails so, i mean the originals were 50 dollars. so there's a trade version it has a different cover but um understand that the images inside and all the content is the exact same the, yeah. the the publisher thought that it would be good to kind of split them and do a different cover uh, for the trade version so um yeah and then the, um we will start uh, we've already started last week working on volume two of my series so in uh, 2021 we hope to have that published and then we'll do another li- a thousand limited edition uh, signed copies as well. So um, your listeners can look out for that. And um, there will be at the end of this, uh, you know, 15 to 20 year ordeal, um, there will be four volumes of books um, uh, documenting my, my Native American work. Yeah. So that's, um, yeah, it's thirty one ninety eight on Amazon if anyone's interested. Oh, okay. And on um, immediately above it, as I did a search on Amazon, comes your documentary. And it says included with your Prime membership. So if you've got a Prime, Amazon Prime membership, you can watch the hour-long documentary as well. Yeah, that that would be great. That would be wonderful. Thanks, thanks so much for the support, guys. Yeah, well, well worth watching. Um, and Andrew, if people want to get in touch with us on the show, what's the best way of doing that? Large format photography podcast at gmail dot com. It certainly is. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we've got we've got an Instagram feed as well, haven't we? I have no idea. We have, but, uh, <laughs> um, but it's a it's a it's a it's a reasonably woeful um, Instagram feed. It's got a bit of information. We certainly put one. I say we. Uh, I I put out um, anything that's uh, directly connected uh, with with the with the podcast on there, um, and I. That's about it. That's as that's as far as that's as far as my bandwidth goes, um, really. So, uh, um, Simon, where can where sorry, where can people find um, find you? Uh, well, I'm in a number of places, as I usually say. I'm on Twitter as Simon Four. I'm on Instagram as Simon Forster Photographic. I have a website called Simon Forster Photographic and where you can buy lots of lens caps and actually. I did actually sell a slip-on custom-made uh, front lens cap um, last week, and uh, the the gentleman was very happy, uh, which is good news. So that was good, some good feedback. So um, if people are after a slip-on uh, lens cap for their odd-sized lenses, if you can get a measurement which is accurate to the millimeter i mean the the more accurate it is the better um then i can make your lens cap uh, or should be able to make your lens cap so uh, if anybody wants one then uh, you can get in touch um either 
through the means I've just mentioned, or you can actually get in touch with me via the website as well. I'm also making more and more bits for Hamy Skills Pixelator, um, which is uh, a method of uh, digitizing negatives uh, by using a digital camera. Uh, and this device goes up to four by five. Um, I've just, I'm just um, trialing a nine by 12, which is a metric uh, four by five. Uh, system, so uh, that, that's on trial at the moment. So uh, um, that's just, that's just, up until this week, I didn't even know anything about it, and now I'm hearing nine by twelve all over the place. Um, so I guess my ears are just closed until this week, um, and that's that must be just about it for me. Um, our music is by Kevin McLeod, and it's called uh, Two Finger Johnny. Um, so that's pretty much it. So we will get emails at some point. So uh, apologies for not, not doing those today. Um, so, yep, yeah, I hope you have enjoyed the show and uh, goodbye. 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 <laughs>